Good morning. And welcome, everybody. Um, thank you very much for, for coming. On behalf of the, the Minerals in Industry Safety and Health Center, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the third annual Dust and Respiratory Health Forum. My name is Nikki LeBranch. I'm the research manager for OHS in MISC, uh, and I'll be your host for, for this event today. So I'd like to start with acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodians of the land on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'm very pleased that so many have been able to join us this year, both in person and online, and we've had an incredible response to the forum with 84 in-person registrations and 315 online registrations as of yesterday. Uh, for those of you here in, in person, a, a few um, housekeeping things to go through. The, the beep beep uh, is the alert tone for fires and emergencies. If you hear the whoop whoop, that's the evacuation tone, and uh, your exit is out this door uh, on my right, your left, uh, and then please follow the, the staff to the uh, emergency assembly area. The, the toilets are back out in the foyer, so on this, this floor as you exit here, and I believe there's a set upstairs as well. Um, we'll have a break for morning tea at 10.30. Uh, for those of you online, I'm afraid you're going to have to sort your own morning tea. Sorry. Uh, we will be recording the, the forum today, and a copy will be available for the participants uh, after the forum. The presentations today will cover a number of aspects of respirable dust and respiratory health from both a medical and scientific angle. Uh, we have an exciting lineup for you today from a number of excellent speakers who are leaders in their field. So we'll start with an address by our institute director here at the Sustainable Minerals Institute, Professor Neville Plint. Neville has a global reputation in the mining sector and has, a, has broadly demonstrated experience in the, the mining and resources industry. His career has focused on delivering improved operational performance on mine sites by developing and implementing new technologies while establishing a global network of research professionals in academic institutes, mining companies, and research organizations. He is a board member and director of Mining3, managing director of JK Tech, and a member of UQ's University Senior Management Group. Neville. Thank, thank you, Nikki, and, um, and welcome to everybody to this forum. It's, been an absolute honor to be asked um, to open this forum on the, the previous occasions. Um, so when I was asked if I would just do a welcome to, to the University of Queensland and SMI, I said absolutely, I would, I'd be very honored to do that. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants. It has been a really disruptive year, and it's absolutely fantastic to actually be here and to have as many people as we do have in person in the auditorium. And, um, and I do appreciate everyone has um, following the, the uh, physical distancing guidelines that are still in place. And if you could please do that, I would greatly appreciate it because your health, safety and well-being is incredibly important to us. So really, the, the year has been very different for everyone. Um, We've had to rethink everything in an effort to prevent COVID-19 from doing damage to the thing that matters most, and, and that's our people. As individuals in a community, this has been hard, but the mining industry, which really is an international community, it has meant facing challenges at every step, from pit to port and beyond. I think as an industry, we've learned and continue to learn from this. We know that, yes, it is possible to rethink and revise practices that the industry has been doing for decades, particularly 
if it means people will be better off. At the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we have been rethinking our approach to mineral processing, community relations, environmental management, as well as health, safety and well-being. And I'm incredibly excited by the research that I'm seeing being done not only within our institute, but within the University of Queensland, as well as with our global partners. And I would really like to acknowledge the collaborative effort that we will see today from people all over the world, tackling what is a major issue that the sector needs to address. In particular, I would like to just mention a couple of relationships um, that I've really appreciated the support and the guidance from um, the Resource Safety and Health Queensland. Um, I stumble over this one because I think it's a new name. I, I, I remember it being called something else. Um, and really, it's just to acknowledge those changes that have happened, and all of that is to make a positive impact. And I've really appreciated my engagement with Mark Stone and his, his vision and his leadership as we move forward into addressing the issues together and collaboratively, as well as the support and the input and guidance from, from Kate Dupria, who will be speaking to us shortly. The work that will be presented later from the Institute really comes out of the, the ACARB funding. And I think it's really important to acknowledge the, the pivotal role that ACARB plays in funding research at universities across the country. Without that funding, a lot of the work that gets done, we couldn't do. Um, so we greatly appreciate the support from the industry as well as from the committees that sit within ACARP and make tough decisions as to where that funding goes. Um, and, and we believe we, we spend that money wisely to give good results. And in terms of that, the ACARP funded the coal dust monitoring exposure and control project. Um, and that involved David Cliff, it's involved Simtars with Nikki, um, it's in, involved the RSHQ with, with Fritz and the coal mine technical services, Mark Shepherd. And, and these reports are being finalized and will be available shortly, I understand. Is that correct? The work is ongoing in terms of looking at um, field measurements, um, looking at control of dust, and more importantly, understanding the hazards, the health hazards. Also I'd like to acknowledge the support from particular companies that have gone on board and are really funding the fundamental work so that we can understand the space better. With that fundamental understanding, we believe we can make a step change. That funding is absolutely critical for us to make good decisions, good informed evidence-based decisions going forward. So Nikki will present a little bit later. I'm looking forward to your feedback from the work that's been done. And once again, looking forward to the ongoing support from the industry as we try and tackle what is a joint problem. What you may also well have picked up um, on social media is we've managed to sign a partnership agreement with the Oz IMM. And once again, this is to ensure that we're able to work collaboratively and we're able to connect in with the industry and make sure what we're doing is addressing the correct issues. And that partnership we were very proud to sign and um, just really want to acknowledge the role of the Institute in, in making that happen. And also announce that um, my understanding is Brett, who's the director for the, the mining industry, Safety Health Centre, Mishk, um, is now the chair of the Health and Safety Society. And of course, Nikki is on the board of directors. So without any further ado, it really gives me great pleasure to introduce Kate Dupria, um, the Commissioner of the Resource Safety and Health Queensland. Um, Kate has more than 20 years experience in the resources industry across Africa and Australia, including working in underground coal mines and in management positions. Um, and I've had an absolute pleasure to get to know Kate. Um, both, we have a shared history, I suppose, um, and, and it's been really fantastic just to reconnect and to look at how we can work together to make a difference. So Kate, over to you. Good morning and thank you, Neville, for the introduction. First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody that's here and also online to the University of Queensland Minerals Industry Safety and Health Centre Dust and Respiratory Health Forum for 2020. Before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we meet today, the Yagra people, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Thank you for the opportunity for me to speak to you today and open up this forum. 
And for those who don't know me, my name is Kate Dupria, and I'm the new recently appointed Commissioner for Resource Safety and Health. When it comes to dust and respiratory health, the Queensland mining sector has gone on quite a journey over the last few years. When I first started as a Commissioner in 2016 in June, the Queensland mining industry, specifically the coal industry, was in a bit of a shock. We suddenly found out that we had what we thought the re-emergence of coal workers' pneumoconiosis. However, we had all been living under a mistake of a belief that black lung had been eradicated, and this was an emergence, apart from the fact that it's actually been there the whole time. In July 2016, the Monash Center for the Occupational and Environmental Health and the UIC School of Public Health delivered their final report into the review of the respiratory component of the Coal Mines Workers' Health Scheme. And I'd like to read a quote that came out of that report. Major system failures at virtually all levels of the design and operation of the respiratory component of the current health assessment scheme. Then in September 2016, the Coal Workers Pneumoconiosis Select Committee was formed and they also found some serious failures in the industry. The report emphasized that we as an industry had dropped the ball and they put the blame on everybody, right from the operators down to the regulator. Now we fast forward to 2020. And I fully believe that the Queensland mining industry is in a situation that is very, very different. Queensland mining industry has dramatically improved its recognition of dust as a hazard and the implementation of the controls to mitigate it as a risk. When we first discovered or first re-emerged, it was coal workers pneumoconiosis that we were really looking and investigating. Then we suddenly realized that the problem was actually more complex, that we need to have a look at things a bit more broader. There wasn't only coal workers pneumoconiosis that we were looking at, but actually mine lung dust disease, including silicosis, asbestos, COPD. Currently at the moment, the Queensland mining sector has 192 confirmed cases of mine lung dust disease. But we've also had a number of legislative reforms, which has been progressed. And there's three key areas that I would like to quickly highlight, which I believe have added to the success. Firstly, the substantial regulatory change when we looked at monitoring of dust in our Queensland industry. The dust database that is presented to the Coal Mine Safety and Health Advisory Committee at every quarter has shown the dramatic reduction in the dust levels in our industry, as well as the exceedance rate. Also, quite often below what the new reduction limit is that has been set by Southwork Australia. Secondly, or well, the second factor I'd like to highlight, is the coal mine workers' health scheme that has gone under considerable change. And I know today you'll have quite a few presentations with regards to that. But I believe that it's now a world-class system that detects disease early, but also provides a safety net for Queensland workers who have been affected. I would just like to highlight what I see as three main areas which I believe are critical to the success of this coal mine workers health scheme. First of all, it is mandatory. So the Queensland Respiratory Health Screening Program is mandatory. I think this is one of our most critical components that we put in a few years ago. Secondly, we have a registered of qualified and experienced medical providers. And we now have a clinical pathway guideline when it comes to assessing and diagnosing people with mine lung dust disease, whether you are in a coal mine, a mineral mine, or a quarry. As a result, Queenland has shown very low proportion of late stage mine dust lung disease compared to similar programs like the United States, where it's only voluntary and not mandatory. We are very fortunate today to have Bob Cohen that will be presenting. I would like to highlight that he has passed a comment on many occasions with regards to the system, the scheme, and quotes that Queensland now has one of the world's best health surveilling programs for coal mines. The third factor which I'd like to highlight, because I believe it's a piece of work that is often forgotten, and that's the educational piece. 
And I advise anybody to please go on to the website, the mine the Miners Health Matters website, and have a look at the videos and have a look at the information that is on there. There's been a lot of work that's been put in there to provide educational tools that operations, whether you are a two-man quarry or a big operation at the big end of town, can utilise. These reforms have not been just isolated to the coal mines. In recent times, the regulators put a lot of effort to ensure that these reforms have gone across to our mineral and quarry operations as well, to ensure that workers in our mineral and quarry operations are as protected as our coal mine workers. In March 2019, the inspectorate put a lot of work in the mineral and coal side to make understand what recommendations and lessons learned that can be taken across to the mineral and quarries. The lessons learned by the mining industry has also been picked up by other industries, especially when you looked at the manufacturing stone industry. From anybody looking outside, the Queensland mining industry can sometimes be described as a gold standard, a long way from where we were and what we were described about a few years ago. However, the success has not been easy. And this is only due to the unprecedented way that government, unions, and industry work together quickly and effectively to develop best solution practices and procedures and protections. This success is the endorsement of the tripartite approach, which is enshrined in our Queensland mine and safety legislation. Without the cooperation of all the parties, we will not be standing today saying we have so much of a success. However, we must not be complacent, and we must never again consider that mine dust lung disease is eradicated. We must always be vigilant, because when our collective memories fade, we need to ensure that the knowledge and the expertise are maintained, so that workers in 10, 20, 30 years are protected, or even better protected, as the workers are today. We need to ensure that we learn our lessons and we do not repeat history. And that is what the people in this room and joining the online come into play. The research into advancements in the management of dust and mine lung dust disease is critical. And we need to continue. We need to ensure that the journey that we are on and the momentum that we have started is maintained. We must build on it and to find new and better ways to protect people. This is where we all have a role to play. I won't hold you up any much longer because there are some very exciting presentations that are being presented today. I would like to thank everybody that has come today and is online. By starting the conversation, you have demonstrated your passion for this topic. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Kate. Um, great opening and definitely some things to think about there. I'd now like to move into the technical portion of our forum today with our first speakers, uh, with our first speakers from RSHQ. Uh, there'll be three speakers as part of this presentation. Uh, they'll be Evan Pengley, Greg Manthe, and Andrew Batterson. Evan Pengley is the Acting Director of the Health Surveillance Unit within Resources, Safety and Health Queensland. Since 2016, Evan has developed and implemented reforms to the regulated health scheme for Queensland coal mine workers in response to coal workers' pneumoconiosis. In his current role, Evan oversees the health assessment process for workers under the scheme. Evan has diverse experience in policy and operational areas, including responding to resource policy changes, such as balancing land access for resource development. Greg Manthe is an inspector of mines occupational hygiene based in Brisbane. Greg's a certified occupational hygienist and was Centaur's principal hygienist for eight years. Greg has since commenced a program with the Queensland Mine Inspectorate evaluating and implementing the QGLO2 and the management of respirable crystal and silica in small to medium mineral mines and quarries. The program involves conducting full shift personal exposure monitoring and assessing the, the site safety management systems 
with respect to the management and control of exposure to respirable crystalline silica. And Andrew Batterson has recently joined uh, RSHQ as an inspector of mines occupational hygiene. He has been working in the field of occupational health and safety as a certified occupational hygienist and specializing in industrial hygiene for over 30 years. He has experience across a broad range of industries, including power generation and distribution, construction, manufacturing, and chemical processing, although he, he has predominantly worked in mining and mineral processing. This has involved both coal and metalliferous based commodities and both surface and underground operations. Evan? Good morning, everyone. Uh, so today I'd like to build on some of the initiatives and comments that the commissioner has just made and talk to you about some of those recent and upcoming initiatives that we're putting in place to uh, support early detection of mine dust lung disease, let you know about a new support service that's available for miners and let you or provide a quick update on the mine dust lung disease cases as reported to RSHQ. And at that point, I will hand over to uh, Andrew and Greg, our occupational hygienists, to talk about their work in dust control and dust exposure. So as the Commissioner uh, mentioned, yeah, since 2015 and the re-emergence of coal workers in meconiosis and other mine dust lung diseases, uh, we've put in place a range of initiatives. There's now five yearly screening for all coal mine workers. Uh, we've got a register in place for uh, medical providers who are approved to undertake health assessments and we've implemented free screening for retired miners. In September this year, regulatory amendments did commence that will ensure that those mineral mine inquiry workers also receive respiratory screening. So similar to coal mining, this will happen at commencement in the industry and then at least every five years after that. So the screening will include a respiratory questionnaire, x-ray, spirometry, comparative assessment, and then any follow-up tests as required as well. And mine operators have until the 1st of September 2022 to ensure that their workers have undergone this screening. We've also commenced some clinical audits of spirometry. We've audited over 1,000 reports so far across 14 different clinics. And in some cases, we have seen that some tests and reports haven't met the standards as outlined in the guidelines developed by the Thoracic Society of Australia and New Zealand. And so where required, we're arranging for retests or, re or new reports for those cases. Now that auditing is ongoing and this information does give us a very good baseline to work off. We're also supporting mine dust lung disease research. We're working with Cancer Council Queensland at the moment to look at a prevalence study of, of mine dust lung disease amongst coal miners. And we're working with Monash University to undertake a cancer and mortality study amongst Queensland's miners. Next year, you'll see the rollout of our mobile health unit. So this is a partnership with Heart of Australia and it will be offering health assessment and screening services throughout regional Queensland. It will have not only X-ray and spirometry facilities, but also high resolution CT and laboratory lung function capabilities as well. And the vehicle you see here is another Heart of Australia truck, but we'll give you an idea of what our unit will look like. Next year, you'll also see the next phase of our electronic records management system, ResHealth rollout. And this will allow employers, workers and doctors to complete health assessments online. And this in turn will also support our longitudinal health surveillance activities. We're just going through customer testing at the moment. The feedback so far has been positive and we're just making some tweaks based on that feedback. So I mentioned earlier that we're offering free screening to retired miners. So up until November this year, we've offered 199 of those with 123 now completed. And these screening for retired miners is delivering real benefits. So as an example, one gentleman was unfortunately diagnosed with a life-threatening condition. However, because he received that diagnosis earlier than he otherwise would have, he was able to access his treatment immediately, which was successful and since has been able to lodge a workers' compensation claim. Now, for workers who are concerned about mine dust lung disease or uh, have been diagnosed with one of these conditions, they can now access information on screening, compensation and support services from the Mine Dust Health Support Service. This is a joint initiative between the Office of Industrial Relations, WorkCover Queensland and RSHQ. It's been running since March and since then we've been able to help many callers access the free screening I mentioned, make a workers' compensation claim or access a whole range of support services, including psychological support services for them and their families. Um, before I move on, I too would like to give a quick plug for our Miners Health Matters website and the updates and new video content that we have in there. 
Also mention that we have uh, updated our information booklets as well. And you can grab a copy of those out the back later today if you're here. Otherwise, you can order free copies from the Miners Health Matters website as well. And finally, a quick case update for mine dust lung diseases. So these are cases reported to RSHQ since 1984 and up until the end of November. And as the Commissioner mentioned, there's been 192 cases reported. And this is across both the coal and mineral mines and quarry sectors. Now, we receive reports from health assessments under the Coal Mine Workers' Health Scheme. We receive reports of accepted workers' compensation claims from the Office of Industrial Relations and also reports from mine operators. Now, within that 192 cases, we are seeing that the majority are over the age of 50 years, and we are seeing an approximately equal split between underground and open cut workers. And also, as the Commissioner mentioned, uh, what is pleasing to see is that in the majority of cases where we do know the severity of the disease, that workers are being diagnosed in the early stages of their conditions. If we have a look at some of those disease trends that you see up there. You will see that initially we did see cases of coal workers pneumoconiosis, but now more recently seeing cases of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, silicosis and some other mine dust lung diseases such as lung cancer. And I think this is a reflection of the increased awareness of mine dust lung disease, initially amongst open cut workers and now the mineral mines and quarries sector as well. And I think it's also a reflection of our screening program and the fact that it's now being rolled out to include retired miners and now the mineral mines and quarries industry as well. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Andrew to talk about the dust control work he's been doing in coal mining. Thank you. Well, a, uh, a good health surveillance program is essential for any occupational hygiene program, and it enables us to monitor our performance over time, but it's only part of the equation. Respiratory disease is fundamentally caused by exposure to airborne contaminants, and if we're going to prevent occupational disease into the future, we need to manage those exposures, preferably down to levels that are below uh, health-based exposure standards. This is a graph which shows the average respirable dust exposure for all of the underground coal mines in Queensland. And it starts from 2014 and goes to 2020. Each colour represents a different mine site. And you can see there that from 2014, the average respirable dust level started to decline and they stabilised around about 2017 and have been sustained below the current exposure limit of 1.5 milligrams per cubic metre. There's no surprise that the re-identification of uh, coal workers' pneumoconiosis in 2015 drove a lot of that change in the early days, followed by the parliamentary inquiry in 2017. However, there have been a number of other milestones that occurred along the way which have contributed to that downward trend. Directives issued to mines to control and reduce exposure prior to 2015, introduction of recognised standards, changes to the regulation, reducing exposure limits, and further standards being introduced. Probably the, the most uh, important changes have been the recognised standards and changes to the regulation. Recognised standards 14, 15 and 20 are regulated standards and they specify the ways in which mines should conduct monitoring and they specify the ways in which uh, mines should uh, evaluate and assess their exposure risks. Whereas recognised standards 15 and 20 specify the ways in which mines should control their exposures in both underground and open cut operations. Changes to the regulations in 2017 required mine sites to report their exposure monitoring results on a quarterly basis and also to uh, report and investigate single sample exceedances promptly when they occurred. These two Significant changes, I think, are what will enable the, the, um, the reductions in exposures that have been achieved to be sustainable into the future. We've also seen similar reductions in exposure to respirable silica, not quite as dramatic, but they are currently, for all, of, all sites, open and underground, currently below the current exposure limit for silica. Although I would caution that some of the sites are approaching that limit and many of them are exceeding 50% of that limit, which is our trigger for introducing control interventions. So not quite out of the woods as far as silica is just yet. Evan mentioned um, or showed previously the mine dust lung disease cases reported through the health surveillance unit. The fact that uh, COPD has started to stabilise, I think, is a success story. The fact that we're now seeing other diseases, which he mentioned, silicosis, COPD and mix, mixed uh, dust lung disease, is a tribute to the improvements made in the health surveillance scheme. And that's a success story. 
So what are the challenges going forward? These other diseases, uh, COPD, mixed dust and silicosis, have their genesis in different types of exposure, quite different to CWP. And we need to understand what they are in order to manage them. They have different dose response relationships. And what about latency? We know that when we diagnose disease, uh, it represents accumulation of exposure over 10, 20, maybe 30 years. And those workers would have been exposed potentially to different SEGs, uh, different contaminants, different sites, sometimes different industries, and sometimes different countries. So we can't actually link um, these reports of disease directly back to SEGs and exposures that we see currently in industry because they reflect the history of exposure. But what we can do is we can look towards the health-based exposure limits and manage exposures below those limits. And by doing that, we know that we should prevent ongoing disease into the future. We currently have systems in place, as I mentioned earlier, around regulations and recognised standards that enable us to monitor and control exposure, particularly for respirable dust and silica. How, how, how do these apply to dealing with those additional contaminants that I mentioned for those other types of diseases? For example, if I take COPD, this is an obstructive disease that affects the airways. And it may be that uh, inhalable dust, which, which represents a larger size fraction of particles, may be more relevant to predicting and controlling that disease than would be respirable dust, which is primarily involving dust that goes into the lower part of the lung, which is relevant to CWP. Inhalable dust is the dust that we can see. It represents the size fraction of particles that we breathe in through our nose and our mouth, and it also includes the respirable fraction, which goes into the alveolar region of the lung. This is an example of a typical underground long wall mine in Queensland, and it shows the different types of dust size distributions. The black bars represent inhalable dust, the blue represents respirable dust, and the red is respirable silica. And you can see from this data that while we would look at the, the blue and the red, and that would indicate that uh, management of exposures to respirable dust and silica, i.e managing CWP, appears to be well managed at this particular site. And we would regard that potentially as being reaching an acceptable level of risk. In fact, the levels are below what may be the future health-based exposure standards yet to be proposed. However, that's not the case for inhalable dust at this particular site. You see that the inhalable dust remains stubbornly high and it's above the current exposure limit for that, that particular material. So we couldn't say the same thing about managing inhalable dust, and we couldn't say the same thing about managing potential risks to COPD. So therein lies some of the challenges. There are also other contaminants that uh, coal mine workers get exposed to. These include diesel particulate matter, welding fume, um, isocyanates from polymeric chemicals, and gases from spontaneous combustion. So how is the inspectorate meeting this challenge? Well, in the last few years, the approach taken by the inspectorate has been to go out to industry and request historical monitoring data for all of those contaminants. And by doing that, it enables the inspectorate to collate the data, conduct risk assessments on those contaminants across the industry, and then report that data and those assessments back to industry, along with guidance on how they could best control them. We know that in the background, Safe Work Australia is reviewing and developing health-based exposure limits for a range of contaminants and that includes some of those contaminants that I've got listed there for the mining industry. As those limits um, get proposed and that, that work progresses, it's relatively easy for the mining industry to adapt and adjust and integrate those changes into the current model that I've got shown up, up there, which has currently been designed for respirable dust and CWP control. So it's just a matter about changing it. So I think based on that model, the coal mining industry is in a fairly good position uh, to manage emerging uh, dust disease issues into the future as new information comes to light. So that's a brief, um, I guess, view of what's going on in the coal industry around managing uh, exposures to airborne contaminants. I'll now hand over to Greg Mantha, who's going to talk about uh, exceedances and awareness in the uh, mineral mines and quarries sector. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Andrew, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this particular um, segment of this last uh, part of our segment will look at a couple of activities uh, currently undertaken or being undertaken by the MMQ inspectorate, and they cover awareness and uh, exceedances, so uh, two topics that are more a micro level. Um, 
One of the findings from the uh, program of uh, inspections and monitoring has been uh, uh, an understanding of the lack of awareness uh, that uh, workers have with regards to a couple of aspects. One is uh, the awareness of uh, the health hazards and exposure from respirable crystalline silica, or RCS, and the uh, application or understanding and training around respiratory protection, which is one of the key controls that uh, sites often revert to, uh, especially at a lot of the smaller sites. And we identified a need for a greater level of uh, awareness or provision of awareness to, uh, to workers um, and uh, an inclusion of understanding what the guideline asked for for SSEs and managers and an understanding of the risk evaluation process. So um, Simtars uh, and the Mines Inspectorate partnered with um, an external provider uh, per train to develop an online training and awareness package. Now, unfortunately, there's not uh, probably enough time for me to delve into that uh, package in detail in this, uh, in this forum, but uh, the um, location of the, of the training package is shown there. It's on Simtar's site. Uh, and it's a freely accessible uh, program designed for either individual workers or toolbox talk levels that provides information to workers on dust and the lung, um, emission sources, control measures, or the process around uh, control, looking at uh, uh, three levels, prevention, um, protection of the worker, and separation of the worker. So it... Uh, it um, distills the hierarchy of risk control down to a, a simpler level um, and looks at obligations, health surveillance, monitoring and uh, a range of subjects. There's uh, self-assessment uh, included in it and um, I'd uh, suggest or, or recommend you take the time to have a look at that program if you have the opportunity. The second uh, aspect that I want to look at in a little more detail is uh, exceedances. Uh, the um, instances of exceedances and then site response or what uh, some findings with regards to site responses. Um, you'll see the, this is a, um, a fairly rudimentary evaluation or a, a look at a data set uh, that uh, Mineral Mines Inquiries have received from monitoring across the MMQ sector in about a three year period from January 2018 to the end of October. Uh, about 6,500 samples, and each of those would have been analysed for respirable dust and RCS. So uh, if we look at the RCS data, there were uh, about 260 exceedances. Now, this uh, one of the important aspects of this is this is compared against the previous exposure standard, not the reduced exposure standard, and I'll touch on the impact of that shortly. Uh, so about 4% across the industry, 4.1% of uh, respirable crystalline silica results are exceedances. And the highest was 2.5, as you can see there. Um, so uh, a fairly high level um, with regards to those exceedances. Respirable dust is a much lower percentage, and that's a function of the higher exposure standard and the percentage of uh, courts across different sites in the respirable dust. But respirable dust exceedances are running at about half a percent, with the highest, uh, as you can see, they're 28 and a half, roughly. If we look at the uh, SEGs or exposure groups for RCS exceedances, uh, drilling, drilling off siders and uh, sample collection uh, run at, uh, they're about a quarter of our highest 50 exceedances. So you can see that there are some SEGs that uh, feature prominently uh, maintenance lab techs. Mobile plant operation was a bit of a surprise, but um, a closer look at that data will probably turn up that it was, uh, in many cases, mobile plant operators who have a secondary task outside of the cabin of that mobile plant, whether it be uh, uh, helping remove blockages in screening or crushing plants, that type of thing. Um, and bagging, smelting, packing, uh, there's uh, other segs that uh, feature fairly prominently there. If we look at the data a little more closely, uh, you see these next two tables uh, lined up with uh, the um, uh, resource safety and health reporting classification subclass on the left-hand side, the number of samples in the data set that have been allocated to that seg, the number of exceedances and then as a percentage, and then importantly, the right-hand column talks on uh, 
action zone results. And Andrew touched on this earlier on. Action zone results are those that are between 50 and 100% of the exposure standard. Um, that normally trigger some sort of a look uh, at the result. Um, those action zone results with the recent change to the exposure standard would now all shift into the exceedance column. And you can see there that uh, some of them, if you look at the third one, fixed plant maintenance and boiler makers, uh, there'll be a doubling of exceedances uh, theoretically under the new exposure standard. Um, some of them are doubling, some of them are tripling. Process crushing will, uh, will triple. And uh, all those exceedances then deserve a close look or an investigation um, once, uh, once we start looking at them at an individual level. Uh, if we look at the lower end of the scale there, you can see um, surface uh, production loaders, uh, truck loading admin, very low numbers, but uh, 13 action zone results will slip into the exceedances for production loaders. So there are some segs that will start to see a little more um, scrutiny, if you like. And underground services there, installation, as you'd expect, running at about uh, 8% exceedances, but those action zone results are going to have an impact again on that. With uh, the exceedances, when, we, uh, when they're reported or extracted from the database, um, we have a program within the Mines Inspectorate of following those up, um, investigating the uh, actions taken by the site with regards to these single exceedances. And we look at whether the SSC has undertaken those processes that they need to in terms of the um, guideline QGL2. So let's have they identified the cause of the exceedance, the emission source, what controls were in place that worked, what failed, uh, what corrective actions they're going to take, and then how are those corrective actions communicated and how are they maintained down the track. This um, uh, is, uh, uh, we get this information by sourcing various documents from the site. And then, uh, in a lot of cases, we'll go out and, um, and inspect the site. This is uh, some outcomes from a subset of data from one of the regions uh, in Queensland, from a set of 30 uh, initial investigation um, processes. So you can see there, um, there were only three that uh, this set that were considered to have had a satisfactory um, process to determine the emission source. There were five additional ones that thought that they had identified a probable source, maybe. Um, a large number had failed to identify the cause of the exposure and about 90% of them were deemed to be unsatisfactory either for major deficiencies uh, or minor deficiencies, certainly enough to be an unsatisfactory investigation. The actions taken by those sites and these, uh, these actions uh, drove a lot of the determination as to whether it was a satisfactory process. Um, there were a few that uh, looked at an action of using water suppression. Um, some were extraction dilution. You can see the water suppression there was a mixture of sprays, um, water truck, and uh, one was just a direction to staff to work as to wet down the floor, but uh, it was very vague as to which floor, where, when. Those sorts of processes were uh, often missed. Um, there was some repair to operation, uh, operators' cabs, reviews of procedures, but about 30% had no corrective action planned at all as a result of the exceedance, and um, that's, uh, that's a fairly significant concern. About 60% had no documented investigation report, so um, there, was no, there was no formal investigation undertaken. There might have been an informal one, somebody had a look. Uh, often the instruction was just to work at a weather respiratory protection, and um, that's uh, inadequate. Some sites had multiple exceedances over time uh, from similar segs each time, uh, might have been drilling, might have been sample laboratory prep, and um, had failed actively uh, to identify that trend and, uh, and address it. So there were some fairly serious um, uh, deficiencies in the investigation process. This review of investigations, RSHQ is um, continuing, and um, it will uh, certainly focus on sites with repeat exceedances as well. Thank you.
um, thank you guys. How are we doing? For, um, we do have um, plenty of time for questions, actually. Um, so the, we'll get questions both from online and um, in person. So David and Kelly are monitoring our online questions. Uh, does anybody in the audience have a question to start with? Come closer. Oh. I don't know. 
the uh, analysing the data would, would be would be uh, would provide quite a lot of value in terms of why that is. But often you've only got to look at the site and see the processes for manually bagging. You know, some of the uh, the bagging plants are still done manually, where a worker stands there at the filling point, seals the bag up, puffs the air out, and exposures are. Uh, uh, I, I would expect um, anticipated elevated exposure in those sorts of processes. Uh, we're not, um, there hasn't been a, a decision to shift towards that within MMQ. Um, I'd certainly um, uh, support that um, because Inhalable dust, uh, for, for me, inhalable dust, uh, the exposure standards we use are, are, if you look at the definitions, they're for dusts not otherwise classified, so dust without a toxic impurity. You look at uh, some of the dust uh, components, and uh, I don't think that definition works very well. So I would, I would think that in the future we'll see reductions in the inhalable and respirable general dusts, um, and uh, I'd welcome that. No. Our next presenter will be Kelly Johnson. <laughs> okay, we've got lots of questions online. So the first one is from Peter Knott. Looking at the health-related fraction of mineral dusts, and given COPD has the highest incidence, should consideration be given to measurement of the thoracic function fraction sorry, of mine dusts? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thoracic, there's uh, the um, processes for measuring thoracic dust are, uh, are not um, uh, not um, common. Uh, in fact, there's only one I think sulfuric acid mist might be the only uh, exposure standard with uh, that's measured as thoracic fraction. But um, it, it's certainly an aspect. When you look at the, the site of deposition, thoracic dust deposits uh, in an area where it's probably going to uh, be less successfully cleared by the respiratory system. So um, there's, uh, there's probably an argument to look at thoracic dust measurement, but um, again, it's not, uh, it's not the focus at the moment. Thanks, Greg. Our next one is a question from Rafael Lopez. How are the personal monitoring results conducted by the inspectors fed back to the workforce? Um, the, when, when I go out and do sampling, um, thanks, for the, the, thanks for that, Raf. When I go out and do uh, sampling, it um, uh, is reported in a table in the mine record entry. So the site senior executive it's a mine record entry with the results, workers' names, and um, if there's exceedances, they also get the personal work history sheet, um, so that they can uh, so that they can um, investigate the exceedance. But as as a mine record entry. Okay, we have a question from Caroline Smith. Are there many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who present with dust disease? And are the screening and testing and educational tools accessible to this group in a culturally appropriate slash secure format? So we have our uh, clinical pathway for following up cases or uh, screening results, abnormal screening results, and that's um, that's has thresholds for, for those triggers. It uh, And what it does, of course, is also allow for uh, doctors to apply their expertise in uh, in individual cases to um, to ensure that the, the appropriate follow-up is happening. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's there's opportunities there for the doctor to take that in their ethnicity into account. Uh, when they're uh, making those medical decisions. 
Okay, a question from Janine Less. Are you considering requiring mines to undertake real-time video and dust monitoring over longer periods, which may provide a clearer picture of how, how and when exposures are happening? Yeah, from the coal perspective, we're currently reviewing recognised standard 14, which uh, outlines the way in which monitoring is done. And we're considering um, introducing some text in there which enables people to do control monitoring, which will uh, enable people to do real-time sampling. Uh, it won't be uh, affecting the exposure assessment part of the monitoring, though, so it'll be treated as a separate type of sampling. It won't be mandated. It'll be an opportunity for sites to do their own monitoring and give them the ability to uh, measure and assess their performance against their own controls. So I guess the clear message there is that it won't be part of exposure assessment, it'll be more around control monitoring. But yeah, there is provision to do that in, in the coal sector. And uh, from an MMQ perspective, uh, again, the, the, uh, from a compliance perspective, exposure monitoring um, is done in terms of the Australian Standard 2985, which specifies particular methodology. Uh, and uh, you'll notice in the introduction to the current version of 2985, it touches on real-time monitoring, but that was uh, postponed, inclusion that was postponed until the next review. So uh, theoretically, when the next review of the Australian Standard happens for respirable dust monitoring, uh, it'll broaden out to allow compliance monitoring that uh, hopefully includes real time because real time is where is where our industry the hygiene industry needs to head um, it's more usable it's more valuable it provides a much better educational tool to workers um, it's more expensive uh, and a lot of small sites don't have the ability to engage an occupational hygienist to bring real time monitoring equipment out to their site they pretty much struggling with the expense of just doing the compliance side of the monitoring. So, yes, I completely agree. Um, Real-time monitoring is a direction we should head, but there are limitations on that for, for a regulator because the Australian standard and the regulations that are driven by that um, are, still, are still linked with um, uh, gravimetric monitoring. Thanks, Greg. Another question now from Saeed Taghi. I apologise if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. Uh, what factors have increased the trend of COPD and what was the risk assessment technique for exposure monitoring? I can certainly answer the first part of that question. So there's a, a number of reasons that we might be seeing that trend. One of them is the... Microphone's gone off. Um, folks up the back can't hear. Oh. Are we back on now? Excellent. Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons we might be seeing that in, that trend. Uh, one of them is we're continually looking to enhance the screening program and bring in uh, new features over the last few years. And the other part is that we are uh, expanding that screening program. So as I mentioned, it's now available for retired miners and, um, and increasingly uh, now mineral mine and quarry workers as well. So uh, there's, a, there's a couple of factors that are uh, influencing the, the numbers of a particular disease type we might be seeing. Yeah, I guess uh, from an exposure point of view, in terms of doing risk assessment, um, the regulator would be relying largely on what the exposure limits are uh, proposed by Safe Work Australia. I believe it's on their list, but they haven't um, changed that value yet. But we would be basically assessing exposures against those recommended health-based exposure limits, which I might add are most likely for inhalable dust going to be reduced by quite a large amount, maybe up to 50%. Thank you. I've got time for one more question. So this one's from John Keenan. In the light of the level of exceedances that have been identified, what follow-up is the inspectorate undertaking to ensure these are remedied? And in particular, actions are in place to prevent this occurring, particularly where you say the investigation process is not well understood. Thanks, John. Uh, from the MMQ side, and uh, Andrew might, um, might touch on coal, from the MMQ side, we uh, follow up each exceedance with uh, the site, get in touch with the site, and uh, as, I, uh, as I was uh, saying um, here, we, uh, we follow up the site, we get the information from the site, and then review 
what they've done. Um, in the case of exceedance investigations that uh, where there are holes or where we find deficiencies, we then follow that up with the site. And uh, this could be in the form of a, a, a mine record entry with a, a substandard conditional practice or a directive to undertake um, uh, additional action or to uh, to remedy that uh, deficient process. So it's uh, it's a mix of an educational and for want of a better word, a punitive process um, where we look at each side individually. Um, the focus uh, to a certain extent has been on sites with multiple exceedances. So uh, if you like, as an example, if we have a, a site that's got one exceedance that's very low uh, and a lot of other good results, um, we'll follow them up, but we'll focus more on a site that has multiple exceedances of a higher level. Um, that um, that hasn't taken action. So uh, at this point, it's a bit of a discretionary process and moving down the track, if we double or triple the number of exceedances that the inspectorate has to uh, follow up with sites, um, that's certainly going to, um, to bring in a, a much greater workload and um, managing that will be um, tricky. So hope that's answered your question, John. Uh, from a coal inspector point of view, the regulation is quite strong around uh, sites reporting exceedances and it requires that they also do investigations. So I guess from the inspectorate's point of view, when we get exceedances reported, we would typically look at the site, look at the history of uh, previous uh, exceedance and also uh, exposures that may not even be exceedances and make a, a bit of a discretionary judgment on whether we think we need to follow up or not. And typically if we did, we'd request the site then to uh, share in um, or provide a copy of that investigation report, which we could then review uh, for, for quality. And if necessary, we could actually go back to the site uh, and I guess challenge them and, and do more investigative work around that. All right. Well, thank you, guys. I think that's enough questions um, uh, for you. Um, but it's been, been, a, been a great conversation. Um, I'll let you sit down now if you'd, if you'd like. Um, well, we'll now move on to our presentation by Dr. Bob Cohen. Uh, Bob is Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, the University of Illinois Chicago School of Public Health in Chicago, and an honorary professor here at MISC. He is a board certified physician in internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, and critical care, and is a NIOSH certified B reader. Dr. Cohen has more than 30 years of experience as an occupational pulmonologist. He's the principal investigator on the Black Lung Center of Excellence, as well as the Black Lung Clinics program. And uh, normally Bob likes to join us in person this time of year for our um, fantastic weather, uh, but unfortunately he's, due to, he's still in, in Chicago um, due, due to COVID. I, I had a look at his weather today, and the, it's a high of nine and a low of minus three. So I'm, I'm sure he, I'm sure he would much rather be here in in sunny Queensland. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, yes. Nikki? Okay, great. There are so many reasons why I'd rather be there with you, and the weather is just only a very small part of it. Um, but I want to thank you all so much for um, inviting me uh, to present again, and I miss you all greatly. And uh, I'm very hopeful that. Uh, vaccines permitting and uh, things moving forward, we'll be able to be with you next year. So today I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, the role of silica in coal mine dust lung disease. And I think that really follows on very well from uh, Andrew, uh, Greg and Evan's uh, presentation, because when we talk about the exceedances of respirable crystalline silica, I think the lessons that we've learned here uh, in the United States from our, um, in our coal mining industry have really taught us how important it is to control that um, the exposure to respirable crystalline silica. This is just a disclosure of where I get my funding from, but I don't believe I have any uh, significant conflicts of interest in this regard. So what I'd like to talk about today is um, the role of silica in the development of resurgent black lung disease. And as you all probably know, we've had a huge problem in the United States with younger um, uh, miners working fewer years, developing very advanced pneumoconiosis and very severe disease. Um, and we are really of the opinion that um, exposure to respirable crystalline silica is playing a significant role um, in that um, resurgence. So I'd like to talk about some of the radiologic evidence, the x-ray evidence, uh, the pathologic evidence. Uh, we have a little bit of mineralogy um, and we're gonna hear more about uh, mineralogy later on in the uh, presentations today. So I won't spend a lot of time on that. And then just some of the um, information on dust levels, which uh, 
may um, take some of the, uh, the information that was just provided to us and put that in a little bit of uh, context and give us um, some thoughts about uh, what, what the dust levels can uh, mean and, and how to take that into account. So just first to start, the respirable crystalline silica is really a nasty, um, a nasty dust. It's probably one of the most highly toxic dusts uh, um, and uh, causing direct uh, damage to the cells. It also produces reactive oxygen species uh, which um, and reactive nitrogen species, which can uh, be very, very um, chemically active. And I think we may even hear a bit more about that later on today. Um, it causes the secretion of um, inflammatory mediators and profibrotic mediators. And the lung tends to remodel itself um, and the causing a deposition of scar tissue and cells die. So where do we get silica in coal mining? Um, and certainly in underground coal mining, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for exposure to silica. Uh, in uh, many thin seam mining, that uh, much uh, thin seam mining that we have in the United States, there is this area of uh, uh, rock above the seam and, and some rock below the seam uh, that is often cut by our very powerful uh, mining equipment these days. Um, given that our prep plants and processing plants are so capable of removing rock from coal that uh, we can take a lot of rock with impunity. And that means we're also taking a fair amount of uh, uh, silica or producing a fair amount of silica dust. This is just a picture of a, of a thin seam mine. The mines that I had the opportunity to visit in Queensland uh, were quite high. And I don't know that you have much thin seam mining, but that's a real problem for us, especially in the, especially in the central Appalachian states. Pinners, uh, or we call them roof bolters, are at very high risk and rib bolters, people bolting the sides and the roof of the mines are at risk for significant silica exposure as they drill into the hard rock tops. And depending on the, the local exhaust ventilation within those drilling machines, uh, they can have substantial exposure to, uh, to high levels of respirable crystalline silica. And their dust collection boxes are often managed improperly uh, and people will dump them in the area instead of realizing that that respirable crystalline silica is quite dangerous. People that work on continuous miners in the development sections of mines um, and I'm not sure if that's the same as installation. I know that uh, uh, Andrew and uh, Andrew was talking about installation and or Greg in terms of the exceedances. So uh, people that are doing mine development are at great risk because they're cutting through rock as they uh, install um, long wall apparatus and are, are building tun tunnels and entrances. Um, this is a, uh, a long wall um, uh, and you can see the, all this rock above uh, that is being cut by the long wall shear. Um, and there's certainly is water on this, uh, but it may not be enough to really control uh, the exposure to respirable crystalline silica. Um, and then certainly we saw a lot of information recently uh, in this last talk about uh, surface mining and exposure to respirable crystalline silica. This is a drag line out in, um, in the West in uh, Montana in the United States and in uh, Wyoming, uh, where we have huge surface mines and there's a lot of exposure as overburden is drilled and removed uh, to uh, crystalline silica. And my colleagues from NIOSH um, published this paper showing uh, very severe debilitating um, disease in surface miners in the US who had no underground tenure. And these are some pictures provided by those miners. And you can see that these drills, um, the workers are working outside of the drills and there's a huge amount of dust generated uh, by surface coal mine uh, drillers if it's not done properly and the cabs are not properly sealed and the ventilation <laughs> equipment maintained. So this is where we can get exposure uh, to uh, respirable crystalline silica in mining. And the next thing is to uh, talk about the evidence that silica is, is really driving the disease. One of the first things that we noticed in our x-ray surveillance programs, and it's something that I think we should be looking for in the Australian uh, uh, x-ray surveillance program, is the prevalence of R-type opacities in chest x-rays of miners. And how, and how frequently do we see that? Do we see it geographically located in certain areas? Uh, because R-type opacities, that is scars, that are greater than three millimeters in diameter are associated with silica exposure. And here we have um, all the other states, United States, except for the central Appalachian states of Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia, showing very low percentages of R-type opacities in the surveillance x-rays of, of those miners. But where we saw this resurgent disease, huge amounts of disease, uh, Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia, there was a very, a much larger percentage of R-type opacities in those states. This is published in 2010 and had data through 2008. It was recently updated um, in 2019. And you could see that, that, that um, as we saw even more resurgent disease, the prevalence of R-type opacities in these x-rays also increased. 
um, uh, dramatically and has continued to increase uh, to a level of six times uh, the rate of R-type opacity. So again, a sign on the X-ray that there may be exposure to respirable crystal and silica causing uh, this, these same states where we see um, very, very high numbers of minors with, uh, with PMF and advanced disease. One of the things that we've been engaged in in our group most recently is looking at the pathology of, uh, the, of the lung of minors that have rapidly progressive disease to try to understand what's going on in the tissues and is there a relationship between um, silica and the pathology of the disease in these, in these minors that are suffering from rapidly progressive pneumoconiosis or advanced disease, which is PMF. One of the first things that uh, we noticed was a series, a case series that we did of 13 minors um, who had rapidly progressive disease. And we looked at their lungs to see if we could see pathologic changes that were consistent with silicosis. Um, and this was an explant of a minor that was so sick that he had to go to lung transplantation. And if you look at the lung on the surface, it looks like coal. It looks like large black, um, large uh, scars and, and dotted scars throughout the lungs. But when we looked at it pathologically under the microscope, we didn't see a lot of black pigment. And what we saw in fact were these round nodules of scar tissue, whirls of collagen, which is the scar tissue surrounding, um, uh, circling and surrounding. And if you zoom in on it, this is what we call a silica pearl. It's just, um, there really is very little coal pigment. There's a lot of inflammatory cells. And we see this world collagen that's very classic uh, for, a sil uh, for a silicotic lesion and silicotic nodules. And we were very surprised to see very little in the way of classic coal macules and classic coal nodules. And in fact, seeing just much more of a reaction that was related to silica. When we zoom in closer, we do see some pigment. Some of the brownish pigment is coal and the black may be uh, carbon or um, uh, uh, other particulate, but we see a fair, uh, you know, some pigment, but under polarizing light microscopy, which sign, uh, shines a beam of light uh, through the tissues and it, uh, that it um, reflects off of crystalline particles, we see a lot of birefringent crystalline material, uh, which indicates a lot of mineral that is not just not coal dust, but in fact, the long, uh, highly birefringent or bright particles are silicates, and the less, uh, the smaller, round, a little bit less bright uh, particles are uh, silica. Uh, so we see that this lung is really full of that, that mineral. So that really made us think that we're seeing um, in that small case series that we need to investigate this further. And this is a, um, an article that we're just submitting data to the uh, American Thoracic Society, which will be probably virtual uh, in May of this year. My colleague, Leonard Goh, is the first author on this um, work that includes a number of uh, internationally recognized pathologists and pathology groups uh, in occupational pulmonary pathology. And, they, and the group looked at uh, autopsies from the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health uh, co-workers autopsy program from 1971 through 2013 and classified um, the, the type of lesions that were seen in these cases. So there was a huge number of cases in that, in that data set, but a smaller number, just about 500, had, had this very severe form of the disease of progressive massive fibrosis and would qualify as rapidly progressive pneumoconiosis. Um, we reviewed these cases to try to find those that we could still get lung tissue and had 315 that our pathology groups confirmed um, were consistent with PMF, the most severe stage of the disease. And we tried to look at them by dividing them into people that were born before 1930 um, and therefore were likely to have mined a substantial part of their lives before modern mechanical mining or mechanical mining techniques were introduced. So if they were born in 1930, they were starting mining probably around 1950 and mechanization was introduced in our minds probably after the 1950s. So what our pathologists did is they classified the lesions in these lungs as a as silicotic or silica type, mixed type or coal predominant type in the, um, in the miner's lung, just based on how many or what percentage of the lung was taken over by these silica um, silicotic nodules or silica type lesions. Um, and if it was more than three quarters, then we called it silica type PMF, but less than one quarter, we called it coal type, and in between was mixed type. And the PMF type uh, was determined by the mode of the pathologist's interpretations. And here's just what it looks like under the microscope. The pathologist, um, this is a coal type. You can see lots of coal pigment. 
a relatively less uh, silica, uh, the pink uh, scar tissue. Uh, this is a mixed type where you do see some coal pigment, but we also see a fair amount of uh, silicotic nodules as well. That would be a mixed type. Um, and then the silica type of PMF is this type where there's very little coal pigment and lots of the world's um, the world uh, silica type uh, nodules in, the, in these lesions. The date of birth of these folks was uh, from the late 19th century through uh, the most recent birth cohort was the early 1960s. We had um, 140 coal type, um, 114 mixed and 16 uh, silica type. There were no differences in mining tenure, age at death, smoking status, pack years, or the state where they mined the longest. But the most striking thing to us, which was uh, really, um, I think, confirming our, our thoughts that silica was playing a role, was that the silica type was significantly higher in the contemporary compared to historic miners. 48% of the contemporary versus 17% of the historic miners had the silica type. And Dr. Go put together this beautiful graph, which shows uh, the number of the, the, the percentage of silica type um, mixed and coal type over uh, birth cohorts. And you can see that the silica type um, increased uh, fairly dramatically. So we think that uh, silica type is more prevalent among contemporary miners. It may be the result of increased exposure to crystalline silica. We think thin seam mining um, has been uh, made possible by modern mechanical mining has uh, been partly causal of this. Um, but this study does have some limitations because it started only in the 1970s. Um, and there were smaller numbers of cases that we got into the study in more recent decades. We followed up this study by taking a very detailed look at the pathology, not just the type of PMF, but to look at the other pathologic features. Uh, and we, we broadened it out to go beyond the NIOSH National Coworkers Autopsy, uh, Autopsy Study and included minors um, that we um, were able to get lung tissue on that were recruited from our black lung clinics in the United States. Um, so we used the historical cases were still from that NIOSH study. Uh, the contemporary cases came from uh, the National Coworkers Autopsy Study. And again, we divided the birth years um, in the same fashion. Um, one of the things that we um, looked at, we looked at in addition to the PMF type were the presence of silicotic nodules, immature silicotic nodules, meaning that this is a process that's really in the act of being of developing. There's a, a process called mineral dust alveolar proteinosis, which means that when you, uh, we think that when people inhale a fair amount of respirable crystalline silica, that, they, um, that their alveoli weep uh, a proteinaceous material as a result of the silica exposure. And we can see that um, protein that's being uh, weeping into the alveoli when we stain it. And then we also looked for the presence of coal nodules and macules. Here's a, a picture of a piece of lung that we accessioned from one of the miners that was uh, recruited from the black lung clinics. Um, we just take a look under the microscope. I'll show you the little tip of that lung. And you can see that there's very little coal pigment again, and it looks like there's these silica nodules in this particular miner's um, lung tissue. Uh, this is a normal lung. You can see that instead of the beautiful little alveolar um, air sacs, it's just a dense scar tissue. And if we zoom in even further, we can see this area that is the uh, protein being leaked into the um, air spaces. And that's the mineral dust alveolar proteinosis that we were looking at as one of the pathologic features. And the alveoli should obviously be just full of air and not have uh, that proteinaceous material. So the data from the study showed very interesting findings. We've already talked about the uh, type of PMF, and that was reproduced in the study when we included the additional modern cases as well. We saw a difference in that silicotic nodules um, were, uh, were much more present, 35%, I'm sorry, 60% compared to 27%. Immature silicotic nodules trended to be more prevalent in the modern miners. The alveolar proteinosis finding, an indicator of really heavy silica exposure, was present in 70% compared to 37% of the historic cases. And then there were fewer coal macules and coal nodules uh, in the modern cases. The coal nodules didn't reach statistical significance. So these findings, again, um, looking at the more subtle uh, and interesting pathologic changes uh, indicated to us that, um, that, that we think that silica is driving this resurgent epidemic and really makes us understand the importance of really keeping our eye on silica levels. Uh, we have uh, uh, some mineralogic data. We have a lot more to come. Our,
our colleagues are working on doing uh, scanning electron microscopy and counting particles and characterizing them, um, as well as digesting lung and looking at the mineral particulate under um, an automated scanning electron micrograph. Uh, we may have shown some of this data before, but this is the work from Dr. Uh, Jerry Abraham's lab in uh, upstate New York in Syracuse, um, comparing eight modern cases to um, older cases. Um, here is a nice collagen silica nodule that you can see, but when we put it under the scanning electron microscope, we can see all of the mineral particulate. We can zoom in on it and put a beam of a x-ray on it and identify the particle. And when we counted up the particles and we looked at the type of particles, when we saw the historic versus the modern cases, there was an increase in silica concentration in the modern cases that was significant. There was um, fewer silicates in the modern and, mo and more silica. So silica seemed to be present when we counted up the particles. And we're going to be, um, we have many more cases that we're completing and we'll be following up on this data um, in the near future for your, um, we'll hopefully be able to report on that as well. Finally, I just wanted to share some dust data with you and that may um, uh, let you know some of the strengths and weaknesses of dust data um, and why it's so important to have the dust data along with um, the um, health surveillance data to confirm it. So here's the data in the United States of respirable coal mine dust samples from the Mine Safety Health Administration from the 1980s through 2017. And you can see that in the entire United States and central Appalachia, the, uh, the geometric mean for respirable dust was declining and our levels were, um, one point, uh, were two milligrams and then they were reduced to 1.5. So it looked like we were doing quite well. Um, when we look at the percent of exceedances of silica, um, we could see that Appalachia where we have this problem um, had a higher number of cases with exceedances, but they still seem to be um, they, in more recent years coming down, certainly as there's been a lot of attention on exposure. But of, uh, interesting, interestingly, when you look at the percent of quartz uh, in those samples, uh, the percent of quartz was greater than 5% throughout the central Appalachian samples over this period of time um, compared to the rest of the United States. So the dust samples uh, need to be taken into account, but I think that also not only looking at whether the, what the exceedances are, but what is the percentage of uh, quartz uh, in, those sam in, in those samples? So uh, that lets us know that there is something different, at least in the dust. We've had problems in the United States with uh, manipulation of dust samples, but one thing that cannot be manipulated is the percentage of the relative uh, components of the dust in, um, in the samples. So um, possible changes in exposure that explain this. I think that seam thickness and the ability to mine thin seams has been a, a significant uh, problem in the US. With, with more mechanization, more powerful equipment, we produce more dust, probably produce smaller um, particle sizes that may be a problem. Um, we've had a lot of increases in our shift durations, the length of the work week, um, and there's concerns about the adherence to regulations um, in some of our mines. Um, I just want to really put um, emphasis back on primary prevention where um, Andrew and Greg spoke uh, very eloquently about the need to uh, make sure that we are uh, controlling um, dust and that the adhering to these standards um, and that really we, we rely so much on these standards, but we rely on the monitoring enforcement by um, RSHQ inspectors and uh, CINTARS uh, inspectors and other uh, private IH companies that are doing this work in Queensland to make sure um, that we're achieving these levels. And um, I think that that's, that's really very important. Um, I'm very happy to see uh, the changes in the levels in Australia more recently. I think that that's gonna, um, if it's uh, enforced and monitored will be uh, very important in preventing this disease. So I think I may be at my time, I'll stop here and uh, stop sharing and see if there's any, uh, any questions. Any questions for Bob? We have any online, you wanna come up? Um, Bob, can you see the Q&A tab? Um, hang on one second. I will pull that up. Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Now, um, which, which, I see, which, which uh, questions were for me here? I'm not sure when that, that was probably the most recent one. So Peter Knott, um, advances in the detection of exhaled breath components have shown promise uh, in the early detection of biochemical parameters in the lung. Is there any potential I think that's a, a great question, Peter. And um, one of our, our colleagues, uh, Deb Yates in um, Sydney is very interested in this. And we're hoping um, that we can 
uh, take a look at um, uh, EBC, exhaled breath con condensate, and look and see if we can see inflammatory mediators that may uh, be an indicator of early disease. I think um, there was a question I saw earlier about HRCT scanning. We certainly want to um, find the disease with our most sensitive uh, early techniques, um, rather than waiting till they come to uh, our pathology uh, uh, colleagues to look at um, when they have uh, progressive massive fibrosis. So I think that's uh, something that we are thinking about. Um, there's a uh, Laurie Simmons had a question regarding the differences uh, in reported cases by region. Is there any difference in testing regimes that may bias the results or trends? Or do we see this pro predominantly due to time physical factors um, that differentiate the regions? Um, the program that, uh, that we're looking at, the X-ray surveillance program uh, and some of these other programs are really, uh, they're national programs so that there's participation from uh, many states. And I would say that there's um, a lot of participation from the states that have the problem, but also throughout the rest of the country. The uh, dust data is also uh, national and run by federal authorities. So I think that um, it's not so much a case finding uh, issue, but uh, um, is, is probably real uh, that we're seeing these differences. Um, you know, the, uh, the participation in pathology, we have a lot more pathology from those regions uh, because there's such severe disease that they do end up going to lung transplant and getting biopsies more than the minors that have simple disease. We don't, we rarely get um, lung tissue from people that have uh, simple pneumoconiosis. Thank you, Bob. Well, I think we have a question here in the audience. Uh, thank you, uh, Graham Edwards. Uh, hi, Bob. Uh, the hey, comment Graham. I would like uh, is that uh, the impact force between the mecha mechanical mining process and the substrate uh, is really important to the size of the particle that is generated. And what we're seeing in the engineered stone sector is that the speed of the mechanical device, whether it's a drill or a, a, a grinder, it, it makes a big difference to the size of the particle. And it's the size of the particle that then is suppressed by water. And so the finer the particle, the less effective the water suppression is for the dust controls. And so, uh, so it's, there's lessons to be learned here around not only the emergence of the silica contribution to uh, the nature of the pathology, but also the mechanistic process of creating the hazard and what controls we can actually implement to minimize the harm. I think uh, particle size is, a, is a, an important issue and that's one of the things that our uh, mineral scientists are looking at. Um, and then it certainly, as you mentioned, makes a big difference in terms of the dust control, which uh, is not my specialty, but I'd be um, certainly interested what the industrial hygienists think about that at some point. Yeah, and I'll actually talk a lot more about particle size distribution in my presentation um, this afternoon. So don't worry, we'll, we'll get there. Um, okay, um, th thank you, Bob, very much for that. And thank you for, for spending your evening with us uh, there in the US. Um, <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd now like to have a break for morning tea. So morning tea is actually downstairs. So if you'll exit this door to go out for morning tea, but for, for COVID to keep the, the one-way flow of traffic, I ask if you exit this way and then go up the outside stairs and come back in um, the, the way you came in this morning. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed the, the morning tea. That is always one of the things to balance. Uh, uh, 15 minutes is a very long time for an online break, but a very short time for an in-person break. So but one of the things with running um, hybrid meetings like that. Um, so we'll start recording again for the, our second half of the, the presentation. And our, our first speaker for the, this uh, session is Dr. Katrina Newbegin. And she is a chest radiologist based at the, the Wesley Hospital, Brisbane. She's been involved in the development of screening programs for pneumoconiosis, including within the, the Queensland coal industry for stonemasons with silicosis. Her ongoing research on pneumoconiosis includes improving the understanding of coal mineral dust lung disease in the Queensland context and providing radiological support for projects on stonemasons with silicosis. Yes, it's lovely to be back here for what's now the third year in a row, and I really appreciate um, coming back to this audience. It's a really great collaborative audience. 
Um, so I really wanted to cover not just my own research. Um, it's a bit of a shorter program this year than previous years. I wanted to touch on some projects I really admire um, in Queensland and around Australia. So just briefly, my disclaimers. Um, but I want to start with two uh, medical doctors uh, that I really admire that are doing incredible research projects this year moving into next year to look at new treatment therapies for pneumoconiosis and silicosis. Um, and that's Dr. Dan Chambers, who's a lung transplant physician at Prince Charles Hospital, and Dr. Debbie Yates, who's at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. So I find what sort of motivates um, myself and also these doctors that I'm presenting today to really do this research is um, having to treat workers like this. So at present, um, this is a 46-year-old stonemason, and as a radiologist, what I watch when they come back for their follow-up year after year, and the, what the treating physicians uh, watch as the patient comes back for follow-up appointments, is you're gradually watching their disease progress, um, or in the case of stonemasons, you're watching it quite rapidly progress. So this is a chest X-ray in 2018, which has early silica changes in the upper lobes. Within a year, it's developed into quite large areas of progressive massive fibrosis fibrosis and with another year that progressive massive fibrosis has grown even further and so at present this is someone of Dan's chambers patients who he's just watching them to determine when to do a lung transplant. So Dr Dan Chambers does a procedure at uh, the Prince Charles Hospital for a lung condition where your lungs produce too much protein where you get rid of that excess protein by um, essentially intubating the patient on one side so they breathe through one lung and then the other lung you're putting large volumes of water to really wash out that excess protein. So there was a paper done um, based in China where they looked at 41 patients with pneumoconiosis to try and use this procedure to really wash out the dust and wash out some of those inflammation that's occurring in the lung and coal workers. And there was a separate study that looked at two um, coal miners which also demonstrated benefit and reduction in the alveolar markers in the lungs. So Dan Chambers looked at doing this project in Australia and to really identify what cohort to do the procedure on is chosen at stonemasons because that's balancing the ethical risk of doing a new procedure um, compared to the risk that they would inherently have of disease progression. And it's really felt that some of the stonemasons exposed to artificial stone have that greatest risk of rapid disease progression. And this has demonstrated my own data um, that I've looked over the last few years where I like to look at real detailed case series analysis, essentially. So looking at approximately 80 people with co-workers pneumoconiosis in Queensland compared to 80, roughly 80 stonemasons in Queensland. And you can see they're presenting with a much younger mean age and a much shorter tenure. And also, more importantly, the progressive massive fibrosis is again occurring at a much younger age in the stonemason cohort compared to um, people with colon renal dust lung disease who develop progressive massive fibrosis. And that's again reflected in the much shorter tenure before they're getting PMF. So this project of Dan's chambers, he looks at the changes that happen on a CT, identifies whether to do the whole lung lavage, and then does a post-procedural CT, as well as looking at um, quite complex biomarkers, which is, to be honest, a bit beyond me. But it's looking at the prognosis and then the efficacy of doing this procedure in stonemasons. So one of the uh, markers that he's developed himself to try and identify um, the benefit of whole lung lavage is to look at the alveolar respiratory crystalline silica burden. So this is a um, diagnostic procedure before the whole lung lavage where he goes in to the airways, releases a tiny little sample of fluid, just a few millimetres, to wash out a portion of the lung and then take that sample to look at how many, what's the crystal burden of within the lung itself. And then after the whole long lavage, she does the procedure again to see the see if there's been a successful reduction of um, crystalline silica in the lungs. Um, so this is the idea. It's the slide I've just noticed that Bob's shown as well. So if we can remove these green crystalline silica particles and reduce some of the inflammation in the lungs, then you're reducing the trigger to perform the scar tissue that ultimately leads to silica nodules and leads to PMF. And he has shown that there's been a reduction in that uh, silica crystalline load post-procedure. So this year, there's been six patients that have undergone the procedure, and there's plans for next year for a research grant to do a further 30 um, participants at Prince Charles Hospital. Um, the pr 
research programs partnered with a program in Spain so we can get an idea of what the natural history might have been for these workers if they hadn't have undergone the procedure. Just to show you one of those six cases that was done this year, so 25 year olds, it really highlights how young these people are and how you really wanna try and stop them developing um, significant silicosis at this age, very short occupational history and the typical story of dry cutting, poor PPE and poor ventilation in the workplace. So he went on a whole lung lavage, which is using 20 litres of fluid to wash out the left lung and then 25 litres of fluid to wash out the right lung. Um, and these are the radiological changes that I see pre and post procedure. So you can see that these um, are the soft, ill-defined early development of silicon nodules in the lungs and post procedure that early softer um, inflammatory tissue is being taken away and you see a reduction in those markings in the lungs. A similar um, concept of trying to reduce the inflammation that's occurring in the lungs in response to silica is being conducted by Dr Yates in Sydney. And this, instead of using a therapeutic treatment, it's using medical treatment to try and halt the progression of disease. Um, so this, again, is the same concept, but instead of doing a physical procedure, it's using a drug to block the pathways that lead to inflammation in the lungs and leave, lead to the dense silica nodule. So this drug's called nitinibib, um, and it blocks that pathway at multiple points. It's a drug that's used currently um, under Medicare provision for another fibrotic lung disease, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and it's been well demonstrated on longitudinal um, studies to slow progression of disease, slow progression of lung function loss. So Deborah Yates' study in Sydney, um, it's 150 milligrams twice a day of these tablets, which is the same dose for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. She's got 100 patients she's enrolling in the trial and she's uh, enrolling a more open um, group of people with lung disease. So not just the artificial stone workers, but workers with silicosis, coal workers, pneumococcus and asbestos. Um, and it's a three-year trial, again, to try and get a sense of longitudinally how have we stopped these people having long function decline compared to how they might have otherwise without the treatment. So I feel quite humbly after those two projects just to show my own projects that we're doing at the Wesley Hospital. Um, we have collaborators, um, particularly Robert Edwards, who's at the Wesley, um, and David Cleveland, who's at Mackay. And I'm really building a great research team of full-time researchers to support our projects. So this is building on the projects that I've presented last year, um, where we looked at that cohort of 79 cases with coal um, mineral dust lung disease. But that project was a very, very detailed analysis um, with 180 questions, which was too much and not sustainable for creating a longitudinal database at the Wesley. So we've really worked hard this year to refine how we're collecting the data, storing the data, what's the most reliable statistically data points to analyse in the future. And we want to have a meaningful long-term resource that can be used at the Wesley. So part of that process was to really refine how we identified cases. Um, and we really want to, because our projects focused on the coal industry and cases in the coal industry, to confirm that the occupational lung disease was from the coal um, industry, for example, a tenure of 25 years in Queensland coal mine and maybe five years um, in their 20s working in hard rock. But most of their occupational exposure has come from the um, coal industry. Um, we review the available medical records to confirm this, and if that's the case, it's added to the repository. So this is different from uh, it was presented this morning. I think it was 190 cases. We have hospital ethics to review cases at the Wesley, so our database is only those workers that are being seen by someone at the Wesley Hospital. Um, we've got 44 cases in our database of co-workers pneumoconiosis, 21 with mixed dust, which is really a combination of coal workers' changes and silicosis, um, diffuse dust fibrosis, and fortunately, relatively compared to, say, the stonemason cohort, only three cases of PMF. Uh, we're also looking at COPD and people who have multiple diagnoses. Um, we then refined how we're going to look at their respiratory health. And so we're doing a collaboration again of the medical imaging and particularly the ILO grading system, their lung function, their symptoms, and of course, smoking status is a compounding factor. So we're looking at smoking status in these individuals.
Um, briefly touching on the radiological findings in the group. So I think what's really reassuring um, to touch on the radiology is that the vast majority of grades in the early stages of uh, co-workers pneumoconiosis or silicosis. So to me, this highlights that the screening program's working, that we've got good, well-trained radiologists now that are picking up disease in the early stages. And this is what we want to do because this is when we can alter uh, occupational practice and really follow up these workers closely to make sure there's no disease progression. So this year's project has kind of been in many ways a bit of a bridging year to projects we hope to do next year. So the database that we've built, we've now got five to seven years worth of data. And so as we, the doctors in the room know, say from cancer trials, five years is a really good prognostic database to start to look at how are people with return to work practices or severity of disease or diagnosis, how is their disease staying stable or the extent of disease progression? The second project that we're gonna do from this database and building from this database um, is looking at the true versus false positives of the screening program. So in our pathway, we have occupational physicians referring to uh, respiratory physicians, but one in 10 of those who are seen by the respiratory physicians coming away with a diagnosis, the remaining nine and 10 are being cleared. So we just want to look at that. Is there anything that we could refine, say to reduce waiting lists to see respiratory physician? Um, and we're also looking at the incidental findings that we're picking up on CT, um, such as small lung nodules and so forth, and how that impacts the health pathway. Um, finally, just to touch on another project I really admire, and Ryan Hoy's got the similar love of building databases and registries that I do, um, and he's doing something similar in Victoria for the Stonemason Group, where they're building a really good data set there to look at longitudinal um, analysis of what's happening in the stonemason industry. Um, he's partnered with Monash and a lot of the data that they're collecting is part of how they've designed their um, state screening program in Victoria, that that information is coming in a lot of the time from the point of diagnosis. So it means they're able to capture a lot of information. Um, so in Victoria, they've done 14, this slide was given from Ryan Hoy back in August, so they've probably done more by now, but at the time, 1,400 workers um, with 77 diagnosis of silicosis from that cohort. Um, and these are all being followed up with CTs and spirometry to look at um, decline of um, lung function or stability of disease over time. And this is the sort of information that Ryan Hoy is collecting um, similar sort of information that I have been with the coal workers industry. So he's looking at um, the smoking status as a compounding factor, the tenure of duration of exposure to silica, which you can see is very short in the artificial stone workers, um, and then the type of occupational history. So if they're exposed from the factory or an installation. Um, there's been a lot of really good papers come out this year um, from medical researchers in Australia, but I think if I was to highlight one paper, this position statement's very good. It gives you a lot of good background information about coal dust and artificial stone workers, as well as the um, position that the medical doctors on this paper think is the best way forward for screening programs and so forth. Um, Jenny Perrick put a lot of work into it, and we all agonised over every single word in the paper, so... Um, it's a very good thing to do as background reading. So, is there any questions? Yes, from the back. I note that you indicated that in terms of the x ray work that you guys have been doing, that you're seeing, um, not sure if earlier detection is possibly the right word, but uh, in terms of the better reading perhaps of x rays now. Um, but do you see that CT scans are in the near future or um, in the future going to replace X-rays in terms of that sort of first screening tool rather yeah. than going to the X-rays? So this is definitely um, a big question, this space, and definitely a lot of medical conferences that question gets asked. And I think it really depends on what your pretest probability is of having disease. So say for the coal uh, screening program in Queensland, I think chest X-rays as an initial screening program is the best. Um, the department can probably quote me on the figures, but it's something like 55 or 60,000 chest X-rays that have been done. And we've only got a very, very small number of cases. So 
there's a risk of radiation. So CT compared to playing films, there's also access issues. Mind bar and more peripheral places can take really good quality chest X-rays, but there's hard, more expensive and more difficult access for CT. So for this population group um, where you can follow them every five years, the disease develops more slowly with longer tenures, it's the best tool. Um, where CTs could take over would be the very targeted high-risk groups. For example, um, in Victoria, their screening program, if you've had very, very heavy exposure um, and colleagues with silicosis and the stonemason industry, you get a CT as well as a chest X-ray to make sure disease isn't getting missed. Anything from online? Or? Okay, so we have a couple of questions from our Zoom attendees. The first one is from Gerald. And he asks, is there any provision to collect surgical pathology or autopsy tissues from your large series? Uh, essentially, no. We do have a small number of people that have had biopsies in the cohort. We've already done um, perhaps five or six. But because we're looking at the screening program and the diagnosis is supported by occupational history and by CTs and by often by spirometry, there's no real clinical need um, to do pathology in most circumstances. And it's our uh, design is retrospective. So we're not consenting people to do procedures they would not have as part of their clinical practice. Thanks. The next question is from Rod to Irwin. Is there progress on ability to differentiate between cigarette smoking emphysema from lung dust diseases? Um, so it, this may be something that comes in the future. Um, from a radiologist's point of view, the radiological changes are the same, whether the smoking uh, caused the emphysema or the dust disease caused the emphysema. Um, but I am very interested in, in the biomarkers that Dan Chambers looks at. Um, for example, if he can take a sample to show burden of disease of silica or coal dust to the lungs, is that something that might help distinguish between the two? Um, and it's hopefully something that Dan Chambers will look at in the future. A question from John. You showed the pre and post radiology on lavage outcomes, showing a reduction in lesions. Is that consistent with all six patients that have been part of the trial? So that's consistent with five of the six. So five of the six had changes that were early, where there were um, early deposition of like early development of silica um, protein and silica nodules. There was one person who had progressive massive fibrosis. And it was an understanding that that wouldn't change post procedure because it's very dense scar tissue. Um, the initial series is being published, submitted for publication this week. Um, so it should be hopefully coming out early next year, that publication. Okay, so just uh, moving on now to the next speaker who I'm fortunate enough to introduce. Uh, Nikki Labrache is a research manager um, occupational Health and Safety at MISHC. She's a mining engineer with 15 years experience in surface and underground coal through her work in the US, Colombia and Australia. She is a board member of the Osium Health and Safety Society, past chair of the Osium Southern Queensland branch and has been awarded the John Boyd Young Engineers Award. Nikki has worked in various mining engineering roles for Simtars, BHP and NIOSH. She is also pursuing her PhD, characterising respirable dust, for which she has been awarded the Osim Education Endowment Fund Postgraduate Scholarship. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, so today I'll be talking about the, the characterization of particulates in, in coal mines. And this is part of the ongoing work um, in MISC uh, within SMI here at, at UQ. Uh, so David Cliff and, and myself started with an ACARP project on the monitoring and control of respirable dust and are currently undertaking a strategic gap analysis of particulates uh, with industry support from Glencore Copper and RSHQ. Uh, along the way, we've received technical input and support from coal services in New South Wales, um, RSHQ, and Barath Bell from Anglo-American. Anglo um, while these samples collected here that I'll show you today were from underground coal mines, the techniques would also apply to mineral mines and quarries and any other dust generating activities such as stone benchtop cutting. 
So when we manage workplace safety, we identify the critical controls and what systems need to be in place to ensure those controls are working. But we don't follow this procedure for managing occupational health issues, such as the impact of dust on respiratory disease, the same way that we manage workplace safety. What we typically do with respirable dust is measure the control in the blue by measuring the consequence in the red without looking at the preventative barriers and the recover, recovery barriers in between. Even now, we don't monitor individual controls. We only monitor holistically the exposure of the person. And from a control effectiveness standpoint, that's not very clever. So in this presentation, I'll go through some of the gaps in our understanding of the dust being generated. And one of the arguments I hear against doing the research to understand the dust characterization and improve the dust control is the, the plan for mines to automate. And automation may reduce the dust exposure for workers, but it requires cameras, lasers, and other technology that are affected by dust. So first, I want to start with some of the, the history of how the exposure standard was set. Um, this figure is from the 1987 Hurley and McLaren report to NIOSH. So the, the dashed lines are the, the probability of developing category two simple CWP um, or greater over a 35 year working tenure uh, compared to different levels of average dust concentrations. The 1971 Jacobson curve at the time, which is the, this dashed line here, um, indicated that there was no risk of developing PMF uh, at an average exposure less than two milligrams or below. However, it was later found that PMF could develop from category zero or one CWP. And the, the Jacobson 71 and the Hurley and McLaren 87 curve were based on the, the same data uh, from the, the UK coal fields, um, just adding a few other factors into the analysis. So those dashed lines are the averages that, that were used based on the original data. But the original data from these um, UK pneumoconiosis field research studies is actually the, the, the solid lines on there. And, and as you can see, um, all mines are not created equal. So there's this cluster of eight here, this eight collieries that have relatively similar prevalence rates, but there are two outliers that have significant higher and lower incidence rates. And that's the problem with averages. It may not necessarily represent all of the data. Colliery Q at the bottom had a much lower incidence of CWP at a given dose rate, while Colliery T is significantly higher than the average. And according to this figure, um, for, for those historic mines, at any rate above one milligram per cubic meter, there would be a significantly higher prevalence of CWP at cholery T. And much of this historical work didn't consider silica when they were calculating the exposure standards. So that means that any cases of silicosis were lumped in with the historical percentage of coal workers pneumoconiosis or CWP studies with no differentiation in diagnosis. Uh, and in case you're wondering, the percentage of silica is actually very similar in the two outlier mines. And the US has found um, similar issues with regional variations as Dr. Cohen alluded to in, in his talk earlier. Uh, so this is a, another view of that, that difference in the rates of CWP in the US breaking out uh, central Appalachia. So A is all of the, the US, whereas B is just Central Appalachia, um, which is again, Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, and then C is everyone else in the US. So given the same exposure standards and mining techniques across the US, uh, the rates of CWP in some districts uh, have gone up, uh, like Central Appalachia, while in other districts, they've gone down. So you can see the, the regional difference there as well. Um, now, this, this is another view of the Queensland data, and we actually don't have, we basically have one, one coal region, but um, not the, the differences in between. But what I wanted to, to point out here is just how little of those cases are CWP, and that's the, the teal color 
that you see. We're now seeing many more cases of silicosis and COPD. And Queensland has recently lowered the exposure standard for respirable coal dust to, to 1.5 milligrams per cubic meter. And the New South Wales reduction will take place on the 1st of February, 2020. And these standards are not based on new science. Um, in fact, the, the 0 0.9 milligram standard for the, that Safe Work Australia recommended in, 200, in 2019 is the same limit that NIOSH proposed all the way back in 1974. So quite old. And the ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, proposed it in 1983. So these are all based on the, the older historic data uh, for, for these levels here. And the case is similar with silicosis. So NIOSH and the ACGIH proposed a reduction in silica exposure to 0 0.25 milligrams per cubic meter in 1995 and 1996. And if you actually read the ACGIH standard, uh, there's no data in there that, that say the 0 0.2 milligrams is a safe limit, just that the 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 um, may not be protective enough based on existing studies. So the, the regional variations found in the dust have prompted the research to turn to characterization work to look at the chemical composition, shape, and particle size distribution of the dust, and not just the, the total dust exposure. And so this graph shows a comparison of the chemical composition of the respirable dust in continuous minor sections in the US versus Australia. So the US data came from Emily Sarver's 2019 paper and I took the Australian samples and sent them to Virginia Tech for analysis. So the, the light blue is the carbonaceous material, which includes the, the carbon particles, and that's both the, the coal dust and the diesel particulate. Uh, the automated routine here can't actually distinguish between the two, uh, but I'll talk more about the diesel later. So there's a large portion of alumina silicates in orange, uh, and Bob talked about those in his talk earlier today. Uh, as well as the, the silica represented in red. So the, the carbonates in yellow are mostly stone dust, and there is occasionally heavy metal or other particulates present. So except for mine three, which was cutting a section with a large stone band, the Australian mines do seem to have relatively more carbon in the samples than the US. And this may be because Australian mines are typically mining thicker seams and leaving coal roof and coal floor. But you'll also want to pay attention when I get to the diesel slide for another potential source. So over the COVID period, myself and coal services did manage to collect some further samples in underground coal mines from Queensland and New South Wales, uh, which have been analyzed at JKMRC, which is the Julius Krushnit Mineral Research Center on the Minerals, Minerals Liberation Analyzer, or MLA. So the major trends hold relatively the same with more carbon in the samples than the US and just a small amount of quartz in the red. Uh, this method can report on 26 minerals, but I've removed some of the minor components for clarity. So you may notice they don't add up to 100% now. And so some of those large alumina silicate categories are now broken up and you can see the, um, the kaolinite in the light orange and the muscovite in the, the darker orange. And not all mine dust has a uniform particle size distribution, and it can vary quite considerably from one mine to the next. So this figure on the left shows the count of particles for four size classifications for those continuous minor sections I just showed you. Uh, they were taken with the SKC cyclones back at the 2.2 liters per minute. So you can see there are a portion of particles over 10 microns. And the, the particle size distribution does vary from, from mine to mine, even with the same type of, of mining process. And the particles less than two microns in size account for between 55 and 80% of that particle size distribution. While the particles only over four microns only account for less than 14% of the samples by count. Uh, and I'll break out an, an example for you. So this was the, the MIME 3 data, and I've put the count and volume comparison together. And as you can see, 
the with the particles over 10 microns, while they account for only half a percent of the count of particles, they're 18 percent of the mass on filter. And when you get to the smaller particles, the two to four, or sorry, the 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 less than two micron range, they're 68 percent of the count of particles, but only four percent of the volume. And environmental sampling typically focuses on the PM 2.5 and not the respirable fraction because it is recognized that the smaller particles are more harmful. And this has implications for compliance samplings. Mine with a greater number of large particles may have a harder time complying with statutory limits, but may not necessarily pose more of a health hazard. And I'll illustrate this with an example. So this. This table shows the particle size data from the MLA analysis, and these were con conducted with the Casella cyclones at the 2.2 liters per minute. So if you look at the, the P50 line, this is showing the particle diameter at which 50% of the mass passes. And even with sa samples from just two mines in this data here, this varies from a low of 1.9 microns on filter 2004 to a high of 7.3 microns on filter 2009. So just how many particles are on a filter and how much difference does a P50 of 1.9 versus 7.3 make for a personal exposure? So for a 1.5 milligram sample, and that's by definition an eight hour sample at 2.2 liters per minute, that gives you your cubic meters for your samples of air. If you assume a constant density of 1.32 uh, for bituminous coal, that gives you a set volume. And to simplify the, the math, I've assumed that all particles are the P50 size. And when you set this, this total volume, you can then divide by the volume of a single particle to get the number of particles that would be made up of that sample. So for a 1.9 micron P50, that's 175 billion particles on that filter that's being collected. Well, for the 7.3 microns, that's only 3 billion particles. So that's 57 times more particles in a sample with a P50 of 1.9 microns than one with 7.3. And that's a single shift. And these are the, the two extreme examples, but when you compare the P50 of 1.9 to the 4.1, which is much closer to the D50 of the cyclone, it still yields 10 times the number of particles. And cyclone elutriators do measure aerodynamic equivalent diameter and not strictly particle diameter. So even some of the, the larger particles that are being found on the filter are significantly over 10 microns. Um, this slide is an example of a large particle measuring 33 microns that was found on one of the filters. So there's also a number of needle-like elongate mineral particles that can be seen on this filter as well. So here right below, up here and over here. And the equipment used in monitoring needs to be verified to ensure that it's measuring the correct size fraction. Um, the respirable cyclones need to conform to the ISO curve. Historically, there had been no third party verification that equ the equipment meets the standards that it's required to comply to. But the HSE has now tested both the SKC and the Casella cyclones for conformance to the curve. Um, after the issue was found with the SKC cyclones. Issues have also been noted with pump pulsation over the 10% 10 10 threshold as set in ISO 13137. Uh, pump and cyclone combinations need to be tested to make sure that they conform. So here's the, the particle size distribution for the carbon, alumina silicates, and silica from the, the first set of samples analyzed by the US. So these were calculated by measuring the largest dimension of each particle and then assigning them to the appropriate bin of 0.1 microns in size. So, and it's easy to see that the chemical compositions are very different. Mine one has a similar particle size distribution for carbon and alumina silicates and very little silica. Mine two has a much larger number of carbon particles uh, than alumina silicates and again, very few silica particles but mine three was very different in nature. Uh, for mine three, the alumina silicates dominate the sample, and there's also a large number of silica particles present, especially for the smaller size fraction. Uh, there's almost no coal in that sample, 
as illustrated by the blue carbon line on the bottom. And getting to diesel particulate matter, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the automated routine in this methodology looking at the carbon particles cannot distinguish between coal and diesel. However, the DPM particles have a unique shape uh, as they're agglomerations of smaller particles and they can be picked up on the SEM field manually. So this slide is a picture of some of the DPM particles on the filter. And that's actually a lot more diesel than I was expecting to see. The, the black dots you see here are the, the holes in the, the filter, the pore spaces, which are 0.4 microns in size. And it's these little agglomeration chains that you see all over here. That's all the, the diesel on there. So we don't know if this agglomeration took place on the filter or if it was picked up like that, agglomerated in the mine. If it was picked up in the mine, this would suggest that if you're trying to measure diesel particulate matter, that direct measurement of PM1 would be an underestimate of concentration based on the, the size of some of these particles. Because PM1 means a top size of one micron. So any particles larger than that wouldn't be picked up in a PM1 filter. Uh, so in summary, I hope that you can see why we need to manage health hazards with the same rigor that we manage safety issues. And that the science behind the exposure standard is not new. It's been passed from the UK to the US to Australia. And I actually have a paper being published in February that goes into more detail on the history of, of the exposure standard if you're interested. Um, we need to know more about the characterization of dust and how it relates to the health hazard. And our future research at MISC aims to move some of these unknowns to knowns, particularly around the characterization of dust, including the particle size, shape, and chemical components and their relationship to potential health impacts. So I still have more analysis to do over the next year, and we'll have more data to share as the analysis progresses. If you'd like to know more about what's in the dust at your mine or your business, please get in touch with me. Um, we're also looking for more industry support and mines to conduct sampling out for this study. Uh, so far, this research has been aimed at coal mines, but could also provide great insight into the respirable dust in metal mines and quarries and the size distribution and shape of particles coming from manufactured stone bench tops. Thank you very much. Questions? No questions? Anything from online? Yep. Uh, I haven't done any actual research into the measurements of that, but just anecdotally from what I hear uh, from the guys underground that yes, when you do degas and when you're, when you're near a hole, uh, it does get dustier as all the water has gone out. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything online? Nothing? Okay. All right. Well, we'll move to our, our next presentation then. So uh, Andrew Kinsella is a researcher from the University of New South Wales Water Research Center and the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He has particular expertise in the field of particle characterization and containment transformations in both natural and engineered systems. This research typically uses fundamental scientific knowledge to solve real world problems, such as contaminated site remediation. The applied nature of Andrew's research requires close partnerships across a number of industries. And this is also the case for the following presentation which describes work stemming from a collaboration with the Australian coal industry, which aims to understand possible links between coal dust geochemistry and cell toxicity. Great, thanks, Nikki. Um, so uh, my talk today um, is about our investigations exploring the link between coal characteristics and pneumoconiosis. Um, in particular, uh, the chemical composition of coal dusts and their capacity to generate oxidants and the resultant effects on cell viability. This work was undertaken at the University of New South Wales, uh, led primarily, uh, sorry, the work undertaken primarily by Dr. Yingying Sun, um, and the project was led by Professor David Waite, um, with contributions also from David Cliff at, at UQ. Um, just to give a, a brief uh, talk, uh, a brief uh, outline of my talk. Um, I'll provide some uh, context and background to the project before moving into the samples, their collection, 
um, and then describe some of the uh, physical and chemical characteristics with a focus on particularly the, the iron mineralogy um, and elemental composition. Then I'll go through some of the biological experiments um, some of the methods we used, uh, as well as the results and uh, talk about uh, reactive oxygen species production. And then I'll sum up in terms of where the implications of our research uh, and also where we're heading towards uh, for uh, the future. Um, so just uh, before starting, I'll give you some context to the work. This has been funded through ACARB um, as well as the Australian Research Council and the overall uh, key objectives of, of the project were uh, to identify whether there was a link between the production of reactive oxygen species and the elemental composition of Australian coal dusts in particular. And then expanding upon this to assess whether uh, the elemental composition of the dusts also impacted upon epithelial lung cell toxicities. And then finally, to understand uh, any implications of these relationships and, and how they might be applied to the Australian coal industry. Um, so as we've pretty much covered in uh, the last uh, couple of talks, uh, coal and the surrounding minerals are, are relatively complex um, and they contain a, a variety of different components which have been shown to cause or trigger lung disease. And these include um, things such as reduced iron minerals such as pyrite or, or siderite, uh, crystalline silica or quartz, uh, silicates and clays, uh, carbon compounds, as well as redox active metals such as copper, manganese and, and cobalt, um, in, in addition to iron in particular. And as uh, we've also touched on there with Nikki, particle size um, is also critical in terms of its penetration into the lung. And so we know that uh, the PM 2.5 is particularly of interest because of its capacity to, to penetrate deep within the lung. Um, and then we've got the, the sub uh, uh, sub micron particles, so the, the hundreds of nanometer size range, which have the potential to translocate out of the lung uh, and into other organs in the body, such as the brain and the heart. Um, and, and while these components have been shown to, to play a role in lung disease, human, bi human biology is obviously inherently complex. And so there are a number of other factors which complicate disease progression. And again, uh, this has been touched on in some of the questions in terms of lifestyle factors, uh, smoking, um, which contribute to disease outcomes in, in people. But the focus uh, of my talk in particular uh, is around iron and silica. As these two, these two components have been uh, are known, well known to produce reactive oxygen species, which, as the name suggests, are highly reactive chemical molecules which can cause irreversible damage to DNA. So, as an example, as per uh, sort of the left hand pathway on the slide there, we can see that uh, when reduced iron minerals such as siderite, iron carbonate, or um, iron sulfide, uh, pyrite, are exposed to dissolved oxygen in the lung, they can produce uh, these highly reactive oxidants. And of particular concern is the, the hydroxyl radical. And this can lead to the depletion of cellular antioxidant defenses, which can result in fibrosis, as we've heard, and also lead to, to characteristic forms of lung disease, such as CWP. And the same is also possibly possible for freshly cleaved uh, crystalline silica particles as well. But while these mechanisms have been well described in, in pure chemical systems, the amount to which they contribute towards cellular damage in the human body, body is much harder to conclusively identify, again, given the inherent biological complexity. And it's, it's worth pointing out at this stage that uh, what I'm describing here is, is only one pathway which may lead to lung disease. Uh, for example, the impact upon uh, longer term lodgement of these particles in the lung um, and the a resulting autoimmune response, uh, which is uh, likely to be especially important for dissolved or for um, non-dissolving silica particles, can't really be accurately assessed by the techniques that we've used in this study. So it's worth uh, keeping that in, in mind at this stage. So moving on to uh, the sample collection process, uh, we were provided with a range of coal seams and surrounding geological materials from our, our coal industry partners, um, and they totaled 59. Um, which we looked at. And uh, we decided to approach their analysis by preparing the dust samples from newly mined rock fragments. Um, and that's what the photos on the left show, these large um, chunks of, of coal and other geological materials supplied by our, our partners. Um, 
and we decided to to uh, to to take this pathway um, and order to produce what we uh, would describe as a, a freshly made material characteristic of, of one that might be produced in a mine uh, versus one that which might be created in an actual mine um, but was less reactive by the time it was shipped uh, um, and analyzed back at, at the university um, so we recognize that there's both uh, you know advantages and, and disadvantages to to this uh, approach um, but that's what we that's how we pursued it anyway and we also tried to, to minimize our uh, uh, the exposure um, to oxygen for the samples by milling within uh, an oxygen free environment so uh, that's what the picture on the, the bottom left shows um, and then these were transferred to an anaerobic chamber uh, shown at the top right there where some of the experiments were performed as well so firstly um, looking at some of the results now the first thing that we looked at were was the quantity of iron um, that's what's shown in the three figures uh, on the slide that could be extracted from the coal dust using a, a sequential uh, a sequential extraction technique. Uh, I've just put iron here, but we looked at a whole lot of other elements as well. Um, and the point uh, of putting this up isn't to, to identify or, or point out specific mines, uh, mine samples, but to, to highlight the, the wide range of, of iron that was present across these samples. The arrows uh, there just to highlight some of the samples that we investigated in, in some more detail covering both that high and, and low concentrations. Then we moved into uh, some further analysis of these samples. Um, we examined the iron mineralogy um, of all the samples using a technique known as X-ray absorption spectroscopy or XAS. Uh, and again, this figure, I think I put up about 45 of the 59 samples that we received there. Again, not to, to compare, uh, you know, uh, or to highlight specific mines, but to, to emphasize the, the wide variety of iron mineralogy that's present um, across these individual seams and materials. Uh, some important points that, that came out of this were uh, by far the majority of the iron mineralogy in these samples were present as um, in its reduced, it reduced iron form, so iron two. Um, and that's pretty significant because if you remember back to the, the back one of the background slides these are the materials uh, the iron minerals that have the potential to cause uh, or to produce reactive oxygen species once they're in contact with dissolved oxygen um, the other point that i wanted to highlight out of this graph was um, of those reduced iron minerals uh, three were, were, were largely dominant um, and, and they're highlighted in the pink boxes down the bottom um, so they were the iron two sulfide, um, otherwise known as, as pyrites, um, and they're the blue colors in the pie charts. Iron carbonates or siderite were the green fractions and uh, iron two sulfates or rosenite like minerals. Um, then they're the purple um, fractions. And you can see from um, just by visually looking at those figures that these were the dominant forms across the, across the mines, but again, at varying different uh, percentages. Um, we also in investigated other more general characteristics of the dusts, including um, looking at the elemental compositions um, of the samples using uh, X-ray fluorescence, XRF. Uh, and that's what the figure at the bottom there shows, um, just the elemental composition of, of a subset of the mine samples that we looked at. Uh, and I put them in order of their carbon composition. So again, I guess this uh, sort of relates back to what Nikki was talking about a bit before, but um, towards the left, we can see we have um, uh, samples which are, uh, have about 80% carbon um, uh, through to, um, you know, about 60% towards the right hand side. And then beyond that, uh, we can see that obviously we weren't supplied only coal seams, but other surrounding rock minerals. Um, and so the, the ones on the, the right hand side were quite high in, in silica or silicon, it's an elemental um, detection technique, whereas others were particularly high in iron. Uh, the fifth sample in, for example, um, from the right has about 50% um, iron. And although these, these samples, the ones on the, the right hand side of the, um, the figure were clearly non coal seam materials, we still wanted to investigate them um, in order to assess their comparative properties. Um, and also, as mentioned by, by Nikki and others, um, they also have relevance to other mining industries. We also examined other um, characterization, uh, other um, properties of 
the materials such as surface area um, and surface charge. Uh, we also used X-ray diffraction um, to quantify the crystalline components of the, the dust. Uh, and that's what the figure on the right hand side, again, just to, to provide an example of, of how uh, variable these samples were. But again, uh, the majority of crystalline materials were, were quartz or uh, aluminosilicates. Um, and I've just broadly uh, classified those as KL and in this. We also picked up some of the more crystalline iron phases such as siderite and pyrite as well. We also looked at the, the particle size naturally um, of the dust that we created um, in the lab. And that's what the figure on the, the left hand bottom shows. Uh, so looking at the particle size via light scattering and we can see around about the, the 50% um, uh, point corresponds to about a 10 micron sample. So they range from, from sub micron to the tens of micron, but certainly uh, fractions of the sample were within that inhalable um, component. So the less than, than 2.5 PM. So they were representative of a, a proportion of what would be inhaled by um, in, in theory by a mine worker. So moving on to the, the biological experiments, we examined uh, the cellular response of the dusts uh, using the, hep the human epithelial lung cell line uh, A549, which is a widely used model uh, for testing alveolar function. Um, as we know, this is the, one of the primary destinations uh, for inhaled particles in that sub PM 2.5 range. The A549 model is commonly used in this type of scientific research, uh, mostly because they're really a, a relatively robust cell line, but also they allow for a high throughput quantification, which, es which essentially means that uh, many replicates can be simultaneously examined um, to look at toxicity and other um, factors such as, as mechanistic processes. And, and this is exemplified by the image at the bottom right um, sorry, the bottom left, with the experiments performed in 96 well plates in which individual, individual variations can be performed, um, giving us really high levels of replication. In the biological experiments, we were also particularly interested in the role of the compound hydrogen peroxide, um, given that we know that uh, it is itself a, a reactive oxygen species, uh, but also because it's a, an essential intermediate of the, the stronger hydroxyl radical uh, oxidant. But equally important, um, importantly, hydrogen peroxide is also produced naturally uh, within the hum human body as a byproduct of cellular metabolism, as well as being gem generated during immune inflammatory responses, uh, say, for example, the lodgment of a particle in a lung. So given its uh, potential importance, uh, it was added to the biological experiments, uh, both in a presence absence fashion, um, in a pulse like mode to accelerate cellular responses that would be hard to otherwise investigate during these uh, relatively short-term assays. So moving on to, to some of the results now, um, which combine the geochemical findings as well as the cell viability measurements to see whether a relationship could be developed between uh, dust composition and toxicity. And I've just focused on three of the parameters that we measured, um, or three of the, the geochemical parameters that we've measured um, as part of this study, and they were carbon, uh, the top row, uh, crystalline silica uh, in the middle and dissolved iron concentration down the bottom. And again, comparing uh, the, the absence of hydrogen peroxide on the left, the, the blue, uh, and when it is present in the right. Uh, and in the case of carbon and crystalline silica, we didn't identify any relationships between the quantity of these components in the coal dust and how well the cell survived, either when hydrogen peroxide was present or it was absent. Uh, in the case of iron, uh, when hydrogen peroxide was absent, again, no relationship with cell viability was um, identified. However, when hydrogen peroxide was present, uh, we did note that cell viability did decrease uh, when iron concentration increased. And it's really important to, to point out at this stage that correlation uh, never equals or uh, does not necessarily equal causality. Uh, this relationship it does not necessarily mean that, that higher iron causes uh, cell death, um, but it does suggest that there may be a, a relationship uh, worthy of further investigation. So we did this by um, classifying the samples into both a, a high and low iron content. Arbitrarily, we chose 0.4 weight percent iron, 
Um, and we wanted to see whether that coincided with a, a greater ROS uh, intracellular production or a greater inflammatory response. And we determined that by the equation shown on the, the bottom left there. Uh, so the cellular inflammatory response was calculated by dividing the intracellular ROS production uh, assay divided by the cell viability. As we found this to be a, a much more robust <clears throat> mechanism by which to, uh, to follow um, inflammatory response because it was able to compensate for uh, the decreased ROS production as the cells died over the course of the experiment. So that explains uh, how we measured the, the y-axis of the graph on the right-hand side, the inflammatory response. And we can see that when we partition uh, the samples into these two broad groups, um, although uh, the high iron-containing samples did correspond to, to a greater inflammatory response, uh, the difference certainly wasn't huge. And the spread of results suggests that iron is probably not the only factor at play here during the early stages of particle lung cell. Um, interaction. <clears throat> you may have noticed uh, on this slide um, and the previous one, we're also interested in seeing whether the actual form of the iron, so the iron mineral uh, present, influences early stage cellular ROS production and, and viability. Uh, given the large variations in iron content between different samples, this can be somewhat hard to interpret. Um, so we approach this by, by simply normalizing the cell viability to the iron content. And when we do this, we can see that there is a marginal increase in response to pyrite containing dusts over siderite ones. Uh, however, it should be mentioned uh, again that this doesn't necessarily represent a, a causal link as pyritic coals collectively exhibited other geochemical properties, including uh, being of, of higher carbon rank, so having a higher carbon percentage when compared to uh, the siderite ones. So moving on to the final slide, um, what do these results tell us? So firstly, our findings, um, from our findings, we're able to, to note that uh, reduced iron minerals present in mine dusts have the capacity to produce intracellular uh, reactive oxygen species. And also that iron correlates with declining cell viability. Uh, and furthermore, when normalized to iron content, pyritic samples correlate with declining cell viability compared to siderite containing ones. However, it's, it's really important to recognize the limitations of these biological experiments. Although these types of um, methods are by, by far the most commonly used to measure particulate uh, toxicity in a laboratory environment, questions remain, particularly as to, firstly, well, how representative are the A549 epithelial cells uh, to differentiated lung tissue uh, present in the human lung? For example, we know that um, epithelial cells are just one of 40 different cell types uh, within the lung. Um, and also perhaps of, of greater concern is, well, how well do these uh, relatively short-term studies, uh, 24 hours close to the maximum to which uh, these cells can be uh, tested across, represent what we, we, we know are long latency diseases. Um, so these results clearly reflect uh, cell particle interactions during their initial point of contact and therefore do not reflect ongoing interactions which are likely to be critical towards disease progression. And thirdly, again, just to re reiterate, uh, correlations do not necessarily uh, determine, uh, not necessarily um, responsible for the cause. So um, just to summarize, these results are, are interesting and worthy of, of further investigation um, but we can't at this stage conclusively link uh, iron and toxicity. And likewise, we can't say that because we, we didn't identify a link between cell viability and crystalline silica, that this interaction isn't harmful, which you know it clearly is. Um, so at this stage, it rather limits our ability to translate these findings to industry. Um, and so therefore, where do we need to go from here to be able to, to provide this information? Um, to our industry partners. Well, firstly, our ongoing research is focused upon using more representative cell models um, of human lung biology, and also how to un understand and, and incorporate uh, longer term impacts. We're also interested in looking at a wider variety of, of coal mine dusts to incorporate uh, what we know is clearly a, a wide um, heterogeneous sample set out there.
um, and also to focus upon cellular processes, which may help us understand the biochemical mechanisms occurring at these uh, iron cell interaction interfaces. With the collective aim um, of all of this, of providing a, a more robust linkage uh, to disease pro uh, progression um, and uh, dusts. Um, that's all I have, thanks. Okay, any questions for Andrew? Andrew, can you wait for the microphone? Because he can't, I don't think he can hear you. Impact on disease from other industries where there may have been higher exposures to iron um, compounds such as uh, welding or iron foundries, uh, iron furnace melting, those kinds of things. Um, I didn't quite hear that. I, I picked up the word um, welding. Um, so I think it was about um, other industries with that may have iron in them, such as welding. Um, certainly the findings are, are, are relevant to, to other areas. Um, we, we haven't investigated um, the potential of that. Um, I guess welding is particularly interesting because uh, the iron that is generally used to my limited knowledge is of a more reactive form. So it should be as iron zero. Um, so it has the potential to create even more oxidative effects um, upon that. Um, so it's certainly something worthy of further investigation. Thank you, uh, Andrew, uh, Graham Edwards. The, the fundamental premise, if I understand correctly, is uh, you're measuring the constituents by a indicator of their mass. And we're hearing more and more around the importance of the particle size getting down into that contact between the alve alveolar macrophage and the hazardous substance uh, generating the oxidative processes. Can you think of how you might be able to modify your research so that we could get a clearer indication of the, uh, the particle size contributing uh, to the potential hazardous environment? That's a, that's a great question. Um... And certainly that is where the scientific uh, sort of research area is moving towards. Um, uh, we have colleagues at uh, UTS, which have a system where they're able to deposit um, particles of specific size ranges onto uh, human lung cell models. Um, and so we're looking at working with them at uh, uh, investigating that, but that, that is certainly one way in which th this field is, is advancing towards. And so we can sort of isolate those effects of both mineralogy and potentially particle size uh, onto the resulting uh, biological effects. Okay, Do you have, yeah, we've got one from the chat. Um, Andrew, Peter Knott online is asking, given you have found some high iron coal samples, would geographic identification of CMDLD cases provide additional support to your theories? Um, yeah, uh, we've sort of, uh, so all of our uh, samples were provided uh, sort of in a blind fashion to us. Um, so we don't know where they're from. Um, we have pass this information on to uh, the Australian uh, Coal and Research um, Research Program. So uh, I think it's it's possibly up to, to them as to, to whether they um, wanted to, to link those, those our findings. Um, but it's probably worth, because we're such a, in a relatively early stage of our, our investigations, I, I think it's probably unwise to, to be start, to, to start making possible linkages between uh, locations uh, and the outcomes of our laboratory experiments. Um, further work, uh, you know, really needs to, to be done um, there first. Okay, thank you. All right, well, that, that concludes our, our presentation. Um, so I'd like to, to give a round of applause to all the, the speakers today who um, gave us some wonderful talks. Yeah, so thank you very much. So even with the, the year 2020 has been and with COVID, um, it's really been astounding to see that the work that is still going on in the, the respirable dust and lung disease spaces and, and just how much uh, we've been able to accomplish this year. Uh, there's also been some excellent questions and discussion as well. So thank you, audience, for, for your participation in this. So both those, those of you in person and, and those online. And thank you, Kelly and David, for helping with the, 
the, the chat there. Um, so we, we did hit a, a record this year with our, our 84 in-person registrations and the 315 online. Um, and I, I hope you enjoyed it and learned as much as I did. There was quite a wealth of, of information in there. A recording of the forum uh, will be available soon, so we will we'll send a link out to participants with it. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.